All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is January 11th, 2024, and we're going to have some more fun digging into Scripture as we always do as we keep watching and praying for the day we believe is coming this year when the Son of Man, when the Lord will take his pre-trib Gentile bride out. And can you believe it? Today leaves us with... At our latest point out, here we are right here in a Jewish calendar, exactly seven months out. Are we praying it's before? Of course we are. But this is the time frame right here, the 11th to the 12th, really you could say the 12th of August, which on a Gregorian calendar from where we are is seven months away. Brothers and sisters, the world is showing us. The world is, is proving it out more and more and more. The things we see going on in Rome, going on in Europe, the, the World Economic Forum, all of these things, it's all coming together, and it's doing it faster than it ever has before. And today, what I want to do is we're going to touch on more of this topic again. The Messiah ben Joseph before the Messiah ben David, and in particular, that point of which uh, when Messiah ben Joseph shows up to the portion of time that he has to when he becomes, returns as the Messiah ben David. And the reason I want to share this, it really fascinates me. Now, since these videos, and we've been able to finally, the, these parts and pieces, excuse me, that we had known for a while now, for what, two and a half, maybe three years? We finally did videos. We started talking on about it more. We revealed that it's true that Messiah will do this again. And it was very jarring at first. I wouldn't have thought in a million years we would have first understood that because I didn't even know it existed. And then to realize that the scriptures had revealed these things to us. And then from there reveal that it was something that in, in Jewish writings within scripture, but within the ancient writings, they knew would happen as well. But one thing that always comes to mind or that always happens is when it comes to the Jewish perspective, to the church perspective, they're always butting heads. You see, because the church say, no, Jesus already did these things. And it's 100 percent true. Jesus already did do these things. However, we know that he has yet to still do something again. And that perspective is the Jewish perspective, which we here in this ministry have been so blessed to be revealed. And I'm not saying you, I'm saying all of us, me included. That's why I get so excited in my videos, because I am, my mind is, is glitches. I can't believe the things that we've been revealed, hidden in mysteries. We have a better understanding as to why now, <laughs> that's for sure. There's no doubt about it, but the, the, the impact that I want you guys to grasp what it, what it means that we know these things, what it means that we could share about these things, whether to the Gentiles or to the Jews, whether the, the, to the church or to rabbis, it's, it's not something when it comes to the church, I wouldn't start with these things in relation to Messiah ben Joseph. I would go to the things that are the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. That lead us to the revelation of the 14 years of the end of days. When we speak to, to Jewish people, and, and maybe you get in touch with rabbis once in a while, once you have a firm grip on, on these videos here, and the again, and these things that I'm going to show you tonight, and their connections from ancient manuscripts, and I'm going to do it with a video from a Christian perspective through Ken Johnson, and show that how Ken Johnson is seeing these things is believing that the Essenes were talking about the time when Messiah came the first time, which in part is true. But we also know that there would be revelation according to the Essenes, according to the ancient writings, that there would be another group of people through a teacher who would be given the prophecies in the final generation for the end of days, which the original teacher did not yet understand. 
He had it from the end of his age to the coming of Christ. But there would be one in the final generation, as we know, that would then bring it through that community, would be preparing it for the end of days. And this is something we've known, we've talked about it, we've shared now for a little while. But you're going to see this. When we go into the Ken Johnson's perspective, everything that he points to is the is. You see, we know that there's the was, the is, and the is to come. And so anybody that's new, the was is from creation until Christ. And then from Christ's death and resurrection to the pre-trib, which will be called which is called the is. And the is to come is from the tree pre-trib until the end. And so what has happened is we know the was was revealed to the first teacher in that community, and they understood these things as the is began. But there was going to be another one prophesied about who would be as the other teacher who would receive it through revelation of understanding that the Lord would give them just through the revelation of Scripture in reading and in studying, and that that group with the community would have it for the revelation and the understanding of the is to come. And we know that it's the was, the is, that revealed the is to come. So we have the studies from the old one, from the new, and revealing this is to come. Well, when Ken Johnson looks at these things, he, like all Christians, would never think that Messiah is coming again as the Messiah ben Joseph, Melchizedek, priestly king, the high priest. He doesn't realize that because in a perspective of seven years, they can't comprehend how this would play out again. But the way to understand it is the 14 years. You first have to understand the revelation of the differences in the Gospels and who they're speaking to, to then realize that the end of days is a period of above and 14 years. The above is 50 days and then 14 years. And when that becomes clear, then in time, as they study these things out, they will realize and get into the deeper things because when you understand it, the scriptures, the Lord pulls you in, the spirit draws you in more to continue to study and study and study. <laughs> Excuse me. And the more you do, the greater you understand, the more is revealed. But you must begin with the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to and that revelation of the 14 years of the foundation. So Ken doesn't have this. And so when you look at the end of days and seven years, there's there's no chance. Nobody has ever spoken about these things because they can't understand it. So what happens now when they go and speak or Jews and Christians are speaking and and Christ is coming again? And he's going to come as a Messiah ben Joseph or or there's going to be an anointed Messiah ben Joseph who comes before Messiah ben David. You can't reconcile that with a Christian because they will tell you that the Messiah ben Joseph will die in battle. You can't reconcile that with a Christian. There is no need for a Christian understanding to think that Messiah will die again. For anything. But we've shown here through the revelation of Scripture, which then led us to these other studies that showed these differences between Christian theology and belief in the end of days compared to the Jewish one. And that's why there's so much confusion and butting heads. And today I'm going to show it to you. It is absolutely fascinating. And we're going to do it from a Jewish perspective. And I said, like I said, from a Christian one with Ken Johnson. By going into the the fragments that were found about this Melchizedek writing. And it's awesome because where Ken is trying to point it, even though you could you'll hear his confusion when he's trying to say, Well, I thought that would be 75 AD. So really, what's this 25 to 32, which is the time frame they have? We know what the time frame is, and I'm gonna show it to you guys again as we get to that point. But you're gonna see that the writings. It, it, for me, I, I I have a hard time understanding even what he's saying and how there was any type of fulfillment in it the first time. You can see pieces of it, but when you guys are going to see this, 
you're clearly going to be able to understand that it's to the very end, that it's to the end of tribulation. And yet when they were showing it, theirs was the relation to the end of one age at the time of the end of Christ, from Christ to his death and resurrection, to a period of about 38 more years. And that's where Ken is kind of like, mm, I, I don't really know what to do with the years there. And then he tries to say, but it could relate to this. You'll understand when we get there. In the end of days, there is no, oh, well, I think it relates. No, we can clearly see where that Melchizedek manuscript from the, from the Apocrypha is talking about the end of days Melchizedek. So this is, this is why it's so fascinating to me, because they, the Christian side sees it already all fulfilled in Christ, which spiritually he did. But the Jews say, no, there has to be a literal fulfillment with our high priest king through, through Messiah ben Joseph, and then the Messiah ben David coming and restoring all things. <laughs> you could clearly see why there is a budding of heads. And why am I telling you this? Why, why does it really blow my mind in the, in the excitement, in the awe of it all? Is because what we have been given, what we have been blessed to understand for unknown reasons to us, but that the Lord's will had it be done. We can go to Christians and we can go to Jews. And when we go to Jews, we can go to them with the Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben David revelation. We can show what these differences are and in the revelation of it, show them that they are all the same Jesus Christ. And to Christians, we can go to the revelation of the Gospels, which reveal the 14 years in the above portion, and we can get them digging into these things because once they see them, they won't be able to unsee them, and they will begin to understand Scripture and prophecy as they've never been able to understand before. We have answers, guys. We have answers that can unite the two. This is how powerful it is. We just have to start getting in front of people, right? This is my platform to be able to do this. And hopefully we'll start getting calls. Hopefully we can start, you know, making more of an effort, not only me, but others as a whole, and start doing Bible studies, maybe reaching out to our churches that aren't really talking about Bible prophecy or aren't at all and talk about maybe starting a little Bible prophecy, Bible study that you would head. And you start because it's the church with the differences in the gospels. How powerful would that be? And for those that know Jewish people or have Jewish friends or have contacts with Jewish rabbis, you understand these things, these revelations that we've been sharing and the one today as well. And you'll be able to start blowing their minds that a Christian knows about a coming Messiah, Ben Joseph, who will die in battle before the coming of Messiah, Ben David. Isn't that wild? I find that absolutely awesome. So, so awesome. And as I always do, I always let you guys know that when somebody's new here at this ministry and you're coming to hear these things about who the Gospels are speaking to in the 14 years, here's the two places to come to. You can click here on YouTube to this playlist right here and start with the first four videos. The other place you can come is to ministryrevealed.com. This is the home page. You can go to the intro page right here. And these are the same first four videos. The next ones after it are some of the same and some are different. I would recommend the ones in order on the uh, website. But this one right here is a 22-minute intro of the next three videos. This one is the first of the three. It's a 30-minute Bible study to begin to give you the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to and show you that the differences within the Gospels and all of their stories aren't contradictions. They're not a perspective when they're clearly speaking differently. 
And one of our favorites is a simple one where in Luke, Jesus is arrayed going to the cross in a gorgeous robe. In Mark, he's arrayed in purple. And in Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. Isn't that fascinating? Were, were they colorblind? What was the issue? It's prophecy. Were there events that happened? Sure, in the, in the is of what took place. But what does it tell us prophetically? Is the revelation. It is the revelation of those differences that are prophecy that reveal the end of days and the differences of who the gospels are speaking to. Luke, so what you see is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the whole world teaches from the gospel of Matthew and barely looks to Mark and to Luke, except for little tidbits here and there. Well, the scriptures tell us the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end is Luke, Mark, Matthew. Luke has a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful, like a bride, because it relates to the pre-trip. Mark's is purple. Matthew's is scarlet because they're both here during tribulation. Remember the woman who rides the beast arrayed in purple and scarlet? It's fascinating. And you're going to see little tidbits like this in this little 30-minute intro. Then once you begin to realize these differences are prophetic in the scriptures and talk about different periods of time to these groups within tribulation, you're going to realize that the end of days is 14 years. Luke's pre-trib happens at the 50 days before, before the 50 days in the above. And then Luke's discourse is about that above portion after the pre-trib and then the 40 days of the Son of Man within it. Then you will have seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. Once you understand this, when you first hear it, it will jar your mind because for decades and centuries, you've been told it is seven years. It is not seven years. It is 100% unequivocally, absolutely seven years, seals and trumpets. We've been able to reveal it from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. It is absolutely true, just as the differences in the Gospels are. It will blow your mind. This is another 30-minute intro to it. Then this one is a two-hour and 45-minute about video, and this reveals how all these things were missed. And it's also because it wasn't yet the time. It started here in this ministry just over six years ago, and I've been doing this now full-time, just about six years full-time. And this right here is the video that will reveal how it was missed with Mark and in Luke that they speak to different people. Yes, it wasn't yet the time because it was, the prof it was prophecy for the revelation of the end of days that was coming. But this will give you the clarity and the understanding as to how it was missed. And it's all because we've been taught from the foundation of the gospel of Matthew, which is only seven years, which is Trump, excuse me, which is trumpets to Jews. You see, at the beginning of the 14 years, the Jerusalem is destroyed. The Jews are scattered so that the land of Jerusalem can rest for seven years before the rebuilding starts in the beginning of trumpets when the Lord has come as our topic of today, Messiah ben Joseph. Okay, so watch these first four videos. I promise you it will be worth every moment of your time. Study them out. Follow it in scripture. Seek it out for yourself. Pray over it. Ask the spirit to give you the revelation. And I promise you, once you do, then you can go deeper into these other things. Like this one right here. This one is all about the, the who the gospels are speaking to, but it's a three-hour in-depth study. The differences of the discourses, Luke, Mark, and Matthew, that are revealed in order, revealing the end of days, will blow your mind. It reveals that pre, mid, and post are all true. Luke, Mark, Matthew. Luke is pre, Mark is mid in the seventh year of seals. And Matthew is post at the seventh year of trumpets, all in order. Seven churches revealed, so many fascinating videos, and this one here that reveals all the way back to the beginning of the creation. So this is the, the best place I would recommend, but you can also come here as well. Here, give me one moment. My daughter is texting me. And I cannot pick her up. All right. So with that, I also look at this temperature we got. Minus 32 degrees Celsius 
which I think for you guys, the the most of our listeners in America, in Fahrenheit, that's minus 28. Do you, do you realize this afternoon, even right now, I think, it's it's minus, what is it, uh, minus 46 with the wind chill. <laughs> Isn't that insane? And I'm in my garage, but thank goodness I built my little, I call it my little tabernacle in here, and I've got my heater on, so... So I'm doing pretty good. It's not as bad as I thought it would be. So so we're good. But uh, man, it's crazy. Uh, what else did I want to cover? Oh, again, you know, guys, it's that time of year. Uh, I wanted to let you guys know, you know, the ministry always has needs. And we don't have any, just so you know, we don't have any savings. It's not like, you know, we've got a, a bank account and secret money set aside even for retirement. We don't have any of that. Even the the backup money of the, you know, $1,000 emergency money, that's even gone now too. And we got one month of bills piled up. But more than that as well is, you know, whenever we do and we do have a little extra, we're always giving it to help others within the ministry. And so I want you guys to remember that, you know, even with um, when it comes to support with the ministry, you can go on the website to PayPal or GoFundMe. All you have to do is click here. The other thing you could do is under any video, just so you guys are aware, you can click under any video right here. Go into the description. We have our PayPal there, our GoFundMe, or our shipping address. And the reason I also wanted to bring it up is, like I said, it's not only us here for the needs in the ministry itself, but it's also for those throughout the ministry. We have people that email, that contact us, and that need help with bills or or with moves or whatever the case may be that need food. And we, of course, have our brother in Uganda. We can't forget about our brother in Uganda, man. Their, their mission in Uganda is going gangbusters. He's traveling all over Uganda, all around Uganda. Bibles by, I don't know how many thousands of Bibles we've given out now. How many thousands of ministry revealed books have been given out there as well. And they just had a request, he told me, for another uh, 110 ministry revealed books that we get for a fantastic deal there now as well. I think they're about $4 US we pay now because the printer, uh, the owner of the printer is now teaching from the ministry revealed books. So, so while they're bringing salvation to those who are coming and all the communities and everywhere they're going and helping with food and with medical supplies and things like that, that we help them with through this through the, the provision that comes through us here in the ministry, whether people sent to him directly or through the ministry here, they're coming to salvation. He's baptizing them. They're doing this. They're touring everywhere. And we have some of them within it, like the owner of the printer, who is giving us the fantastic deal on printing the books, which you see happening here. And he is also teaching from the book. So what are we doing? It is salvation first and readying a people. So you can see that from this page, too. You can also donate here as well. So I wanted to mention that because it simply is a time of year when things get very tight. And um, we need to remember that we're, we're still doing this. We are still in it. We are still strengthening. We are still uplifting. We are still doing everything that we need to do to spread the gospel and to prepare a people. That's what we're doing here. All right. And it's so awesome. Let me show you guys this. It is so awesome. I had to share this with you guys. This is our brother Ivan uh, from South Africa. He had done a Bible study at a church, and he didn't know if he was going to be invited back because it was on prophecy. And he ended up getting a call back on coming to teach Bible prophecy. And I want to read this to you. This is a post after he had told us he was going to be invited back. And uh, this is after he had done it. It wasn't three hours ago. This is about a day or so ago, or this morning or a day ago. And he says, I just got home. It went very well tonight. A few new people. So we went over some of the stuff shared last week and then some new stuff. Repetition is a good thing. And many were grateful for the repetition. Absolutely. Amen. Brothers and sisters, repetition is key. You go to anybody in anything, in any discipline, in any anything that they do, and they're good at it and they're the best at what they do. It's repetition, 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 repetition. Yes, you add more. Yes, you add more detail. Yes, you do a little something else here and a little something else there. But the foundation is the repetition, the repetition of the key things. 
You see, it's important, guys. And he says, uh, started with revision of the differences in the synoptic gospels and who the gospels are speaking to. Amen. That's exactly right. That's where you start, right? Because you're speaking to a group of Christians, like I was saying earlier. Then some stuff uh, on the Lord's three-part harvest model. The pre, the mid, the post related to the harvest, you see? And the birth after travail in Revelation 12 versus the birth before travail in Isaiah 66 uh, in verse 7 that we know about. Again, foundational to show where the pre is before the mid that we can show from Revelation 12 to Isaiah 66. There is definitely some understanding and excitement and the group didn't chuck me out. Uh, so that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely, right? That's always the fear that we get chucked out when we're talking about these differences that have never been understood before, right? It's happening, guys. It's happening. And Ivan is a perfect, a perfect example. And it was the church that invited him back for it. Fantastic. Uh, we'll be continuing with more lessons next week. This is a great one. I wanted to show you this for this as well. Uh, this picture of the rocks was shared on the forum a few days ago. It's a fantastic example of how end time understanding is hidden in the scriptures. And one, one gets, when one gets to see the message, you can't unsee it. We talk about this all the time here, right? Once you see and understand the differences in the gospels in who the rebel, in who the gospels are speaking to, you will never be able to read them the same again. You will have such an understanding that as you're reading, your mind will always draw you into these differences and then to search them out, and it's absolutely fascinating. That's why it's such a great place to start, because, and not only is it a great place to start just because, you know, it's in the Gospels, but it's where it started even with me. It started with Revelation 12 to Luke and Isaiah, uh, Luke 21, and in Isaiah 66. And the very first thing that came about from that was the revelation of the Gospels, which soon followed within just a few weeks by the end of October. So it started in September of 2017. And by the end of October, the revelation of the 14 years started to reveal itself. Because when you see these differences in the Gospels and you realize that the discourses are different to different groups of people at different times, you're like, what? And then bang, the 14 years and the above reveals itself. So some of the groups saw it immediately. So now talking about the rocks. So to, to show that, you know, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So some of the group saw it immediately, but others needed some help and others needed more help. But eventually everybody was able to see the message in the rocks. Can you see the message in the rocks? I couldn't. I couldn't see it. You see, when the more you zoom in, the bigger the picture is, the harder it is to see. Well, what happens is there was a little caption above it in the original post that said, if you if you go further away from it, you'll be able to see it. And so what I would recommend is if you guys haven't yet seen what it says in the rocks, stand further back from it. And the smaller it is, you will clearly see exactly what it says. What had happened is I kept looking, I kept looking, and so I started shrinking it and stepping back from it, and boom, it popped up. And then I went and clicked on something, and I saw it as a thumbnail as I downloaded it. And when I saw it as a thumbnail, it was like written with marker. It was so clear. It's fantastic. So it's a wonderful example. Like Ivan said, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. It's the same with the Gospels. You see, and that's what he went on to say here. So, and, and thanks for all the encouragement and support. Absolutely, brother. Well done. This is what we are hoping for. This is what we are praying for, is to be able to understand these things to draw closer, to draw others in, to what? To prepare a people for the Lord. To ready them. To reveal the revelation and prepare them for the time that is fast approaching. For the Jews, hopefully we can reach some of them now to show them that their Messiah is our Messiah. And when you see this, when it comes to the Hebrew, to the Jewish guy, and what he says, it's almost like he's talking about the entirety of tribulation. But he's not able to fully understand where it goes and how it plays out in its timing. But he has it in a way that no Christian outside of us has it, although we have it with much more detail. He knows there's events before Messiah ben David. 
He knows there is a Messiah Ben David. He knows something happens to Messiah Ben David. And he knows, uh, sorry, sorry, Messiah Ben Joseph. And then he knows Messiah Ben Joseph, then uh, Messiah Ben David, sorry, then comes at the end. It's awesome. And we can connect them, guys. We can connect them. So with that, as we get going here, I also want to ask for prayers uh, for my mother. Uh, my mother, she wasn't feeling good, and she's on her own. She's 82 years old, living in Ottawa. I'm on the other side of the country in Calgary. My sister's down in Texas, and um, my sister's a, a good daughter. She's always uh, calling her every day, of course, and keeping in touch with her and everything else. My mom has some friends, but, you know, people are older, right? They, they can't just come and help all the time. So we're also looking to have her come out to Calgary, um, but it's a very tight market right now and be able to find a rental. She can still live on her own, um, but that's what I'm going to start doing. We're going to start looking at places uh, so that we can move her out here and get her, get her a place relatively close to us uh, in an apartment so she still has her own independence that she likes, uh, but now she'll be close to family. Um, so that's something I'm also doing on the side here. But my mother wasn't feeling good. Uh, she ended up calling the uh, the a nurse line in Ottawa. They had her come in, so she went to emergency, stayed up all night before they saw her in the emergency, and uh, they went and did some scans on her, and she has a hernia that had been causing her some pain, obviously, and there's some sort of blockage. So they're doing scans and everything on her, and uh, hopefully everything is fine. There's nothing serious, and uh, it will be clearly taking over, and the Lord is watching over, as she knows, and we all know. So I'd like uh, your prayers for my dear mother uh, on that as well would be greatly appreciated. So with that, let's get started after I unzip my jacket, because I can't believe it's actually getting this warm in the garage. <laughs> I love it. That was the purpose of this, building this, so that I wouldn't be freezing when I was in here. And it's working. All right. Now, let's go have a listen to this guy. Now, I want you to understand, <laughs> he's not the easiest to, to hear. So I'm not playing it on fast speed. I only have it at one and a quarter. Um, but his accent is very thick because I think he's Scottish or Irish Jew, Jewish guy. So you might have to go listen to it yourself if you want again. Yeah, uh, this is his channel right here. I actually sent him an email, so hopefully I, I hear back from him because what he talks about is exactly to to an extent uh, in the beginning here is what I believe as well. We know that the ten tribes have scattered throughout the earth. We've been saying this forever, and that the ten tribes ended up mixing in with the Gentiles, and they are the ones throughout the West, right? The world throughout the West, and we've talked about this many times. And, you know, the, 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 the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in. And he mentions this in the beginning. He talks about it. He says it's what they believe in his, in his group and what they're trying to get out to the world as well. So we're going to listen to it, but I want you to know that he has a thick accent. But we're going to cover some things here um, as, we, as, as it's going. And uh, I'll break in to show these different portions in these times that he's talking about. It's awesome. This is this is what I was telling you. So this is the Jewish perspective, and you can totally see and understand why there's this 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 headbutting of Christians and Jews when it comes to this. Now, what do here's another thing. What do we know about it? Paul tells us in Romans that that this is happening for our benefit. That their fall was for us to come in until the time of grace, until the time of the Gentiles comes to an end. The time of the Gentiles, which is connected to the house of Israel, when it comes to the end, it's the end of seals. That's why the great multitude rapture of the house of Israel comes in at the end of seals. When, do the, when does it come in? At the end of seals, when Messiah ben Joseph, who is Mal, Malchizedek, the high priest, comes in. Remember, that's through who Joshua was, Yeshua Joshua. Moses died, and Joshua, the high priest, Took them in over the pro uh, took them over into the promised land. That's precisely it's the same timing this guy talks about. The Christians can't put these things together yet, but yet neither can fully the Jews. We have 
the, the tie that binds them, guys. It is so exciting. We just now need to do what we can, make more of an effort for those that can to just try and reach more because it is so fantastic. So let's have a listen. Things of great interest, and we invite you to listen to us. Western tribes are amongst the Western nations. That is uh, the Western tribes that we found among. So he says the Western tribes, or right, the House of Israel, is amongst Western nations. So people of Finland, of Sweden, of Denmark, of Norway, of the Netherlands, of Belgium, of Luxembourg, of France, Switzerland. England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland, also in North America, USA and Canada, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa and other areas. Lost in tribes amongst those areas are in those places. We don't say that everyone there belongs to Lost in tribes, but that is where the Lost in tribes are to be found. That is where they will be found. That is where they will give expression to their, what they are, and they have already done so. And in a historical sense, in the future they will continue to do so. That is where the future developments, the future revelations of biblical prophecy are going to take place from those areas. So we advise you... See, and this is where biblical prophecy will come from those areas. He says they will come to reunite again. They will come to... He's going to say they're going to come to understand who they are. You see, they will by the end of seals, right? They will by the end of seals. And he mentions this as we go a little bit further. He understands that the tribe of the house of Israel are spread throughout the Western nations, They've, they've been doing their part. They've been slowly waking up. So, so their understanding of who they are has vanished, right? It's gone from their memory. And they're slowly coming back. Well, how, how is that happening? Christians. It's the Christians. The house of Israel, the Gentiles that are grafted in with them. They're growing and they're coming back and they're coming back. They're awakening and awake. It's the Christians, guys. That's what he's talking about. To listen to us, to take uh, cognizance of what we are telling you, and to check it out, check it out, because you'll see that it does check out. And this is what we have, and this is what we believe in, and uh, this is the truth. And we identify, we identify the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Dan with the people in Denmark, also uh, contingents of Dan also to be found in other areas, including in Ireland and the British Isles. Even though the British Isles on the whole, they are the domain of the tribes of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. But uh, with that in mind, keep in mind, that in mind when we go through this present talk concerning the tribe of Dan and the future revelation of... So he's talking about Dan. He, he mentions it briefly. When we get to that point a little further down in the video, we're not going to cover it because I'm working on that for something else. Because remember, Dan has two parts, right? I don't know if you guys remember that. Dan has two different banners, right? Dan has the overcoming eagle, and Dan has the serpent. So Dan is the eagle and the serpent. So the overcoming eagle, right? You either remain on your belly or become an overcomer like an eagle. Like who? Like Aquila, right? Like the Priscilla's and the Aquila's who put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, which is that prophetic picture we've been talking about many times over the years where they're putting their necks on the line is the prophetic picture during the time of seals working to wake them up. And then you've got Dan, which is the serpent side. A lot of people will tell you that, believe that the Antichrist comes from the tribe of Dan. And that's because Dan, the non-overcomer side, is the serpent that remains on his belly. So of course that would make sense, right? And they'll tell you that the Antichrist comes from Dan. But what most don't tell you is that there's the eagle overcoming side as well. And so we're going to get into that, but I'm, I'm doing that on a study for something else. I was working on it for this one until I came across um, uh, the video with Ken Johnson about Melchizedek from the fragments that were found. And I thought it would just be an overall great tie-in because when he goes in to talk about Messiah ben Joseph and, the, and this connection and this time as to when and everything else, it would be a great tie-in to what Ken talks about from a different Christian perspective that can't see it in the Jewish perspective. Fascinating. That's why Jews can't see Christ in the Christian perspective because he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see? So we know there's still something coming for the Jews and they will recognize it when he comes as Messiah ben Joseph, a conquering king who destroys their enemies and then is high priest and king. 
You see that, and we'll we'll get to it. But that's why we have in uh, even in Zechariah chapter eight that the house of Israel and the house of Judah, no more crying. Let your hands be strong because they're going to start to rebuild. Christians will tell you that when they start rebuilding the temple, it's the Antichrist building it, and then the Antichrist will come in and declare himself God. Absolutely not. At no point in history was that the Antichrist or the enemy that built the temple of God. Never, ever. So it's not going to happen now either. And we can prove it. We, we've proved it for years now. So we know it's because Messiah ben Joseph, who is Jesus coming as high priest and king, Melchizedek, is going to be there. And so is the Zerubbabel, the, the other anointed one, who will be in charge of the rebuilding, while Messiah ben Joseph the high priest is going to be over the 144,000. But wait until you see these connections between the, the Jewish and the Gentile. It's, <laughs> it's awesome that we can see it and combine it. Prophecy in our world. Now we have a principle in the Jewish thought. Incidentally, we ourselves are Jewish. We believe in the Jewish religion, practice the Jewish religion, and do what we can to learn what we have to a lot of our sources are derived from Judaism or through learning the Bible in the light of Jewish commentaries, rabbinical commentaries. And uh, once you're understanding, they are, are reliable and enlightening. And the present talk is also based on a, uh, an article in Hebrew by a rabbi, Rabbi Baruch Ephrati. We never don't know him. As far as we know, we never met him. But he writes articles of some depth on the Internet. And uh, the sources that he gave in, on, in, in an article concerning Dan, the tribe of Dan, and the Messianic Revelation, is what we used for what we're about to tell you. So, we had the principle in the end times that there will come a Messiah. Will come a Messiah descended from David. David will give rise from a Messiah. The son of David will, become, will be the Messiah. Messiah, son of David, and he will help save all of the Israelite tribes, to unite all of the Israelite tribes together, and he will save the world, ultimately save the world, and that's what the Messiah... Okay, so he starts with the end. He's saying a Messiah, Ben David, will come. He will eventually reunite all the tribes together, the, the, the house of Israel, house of Judah, and will save the whole world, and we know rule and reign. So he's talking about the end, which we know is when Messiah, Ben David, comes, feet down, destroys the enemies, and so forth, right? Let's keep going. Messiah son of David will do, and even in Judaism, it is a, an obligation to believe in his coming. Every Jew, according to the Articles of Faith, the 13 Articles of Faith of Maimonides, should believe in the Messiah and the coming of the Messiah. And even though he delays his coming, we will wait for him every day that he comes, that he should come. So we have the Messiah, and we have the, the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. Sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the forefathers. Jacob was renamed Israel. Jacob gave rise to 12 sons. He begat 12 sons to the forefather of Israel, the tribes. They were together in the land of Israel. They came out of Egypt. They went down to Egypt and they came out of Egypt under Moses. They conquered the land of Canaan under Joshua. And they divided the land up amongst them. And then came King Saul. After King Saul came King David. After King David came King Solomon. After King Solomon came Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. In the time of Solomon, Actually, in the time of the son of Solomon, Rehoboam, in his time, ten of the northern kingdom tribes uh, seceded. They set up their own kingdom, the kingdom of Israel in the north. House of Israel. And this kingdom was conquered about uh, 200 years, round figures, uh, 200 years, say, after the secession, after the division, the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians and all of its, senses, all of its inhabitants were taken away. All of its cities and settlements were destroyed, as, did, as confirmed by archaeological findings, and all of its inhabitants were taken away. And they were taken away, and they were taken away to areas in the north and also overseas, and by various paths after the passing of another several centuries, they all eventually all moved, or in stages, they all moved to the west, and they converged in northwest Europe, and uh, western areas of Europe, and that is where they are to be found, that is where their ancestors' descendants are to be found today, as well as all shoots from the peoples who come out of them, such as North America, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. And they don't know who they are, they lost consciousness, they lost awareness of their ancestry, they lost awareness of who they are. So it was prophesied that that would be the case, it was prophesied that they would forget who they were, what they were, and their relationship to Judah, the Jewish people, they would forget that. Uh, but eventually, 
it would come back to them. It would be brought back to them in the end times so it would come aware of it. When we don't know. But this could be what we are doing. Our will could be part of this. And they need to know it. They need to know it in order to survive. And see, this is exactly what we talk about. This is their portion of seals. In the end of days, they will come to know it and they will be joined. See, even to the end of seals, that is when they come back. That is when their portion is over. You need to know who you are to do what you have to do because that is why you are put here on this earth. So uh, this is of interest, this is of importance. And uh, in the end times, in addition to the Messiah son of David, who will definitely come, before he comes, before he comes, there is another principle that it may be understood from certain biblical prophecies, indications in the biblical text, also rabbinical traditions, that there will be another Messiah. There will be Messiah son of Joseph. A Mess there we go. See? He said before, yes, Messiah ben David will come. We know that's the end, right? We, we've shared on that many times. We know it from, from the house of Judah, the lion's whelp when he's coming on the ass's colt, uh, and the fowl, uh, the wine dipped, uh, clothes wine garment in wine, and his clothes dipped in the blood of grapes. We know this is when he comes as king of kings and lord of lords, all uppercase, in the wine press and the treading of the wine press of Almighty God, this is the final 14th year of tribulation. This is when he is returned feet down as lightning from one end unto the other as Messiah ben David. But before he comes as Messiah ben David, we know from the end of the sixth year of seals through the portions of trumpets to the end of the sixth year of trumpets, he has come as Messiah ben Joseph high priest and king Melchizedek. That is what he's talking about now. When you, Whenever you hear people say that a Messiah ben Joseph, especially when you hear Jews or Christians talk about it, uh, as Ken Johnson through, um, uh, uh, through Apocryphas, this, when, they, when one talks about Messiah ben Joseph and another talks about Melchizedek or one talking about Messiah ben Joseph, even as Christians, and doesn't realize that it's Melchizedek, it's the exact same thing. He is coming as Messiah ben Joseph, high priest and king Melchizedek. The son of Joseph will be descended from Ephraim, or possibly from Manasseh. Well, uh, most of the sources say Ephraim, from the tribes of Joseph. The tribes of Joseph being now in the West, or concentrated in the West, their maidens and source being in the West, and they fulfill, have fulfilled the prophecies concerning the ten tribes. Concerning Abraham will become a great and mighty nation and whose seed would possess the gates of their enemies and all the major strategic areas on the earth and that they would be exceedingly great, exceedingly multitudinous, a very, very great many of them as the sands of the sea, as the stars of heaven, as the dust of the earth and extremely wealthy, relatively speaking, and also relatively speaking, they would do justice and judgment and be the battle axe of the Almighty and begin to reform mankind because the purpose of the exile, the purpose of the tribes for getting who they were was that they should go down to the level of the Gentiles to the level of the heathen, become heathen, become like them, descend to their level, and then evolve upwards and drag the rest of humanity with them. And that is what they have done to some degree. And you see, and he was just talking about as, what would it be? He said, connected through Abraham, right? Remember the teachings on Abraham in relation to Hebrews? We have Enoch, the pre-trib group. Enoch was translated, right? lived by faith, did not see death. Uh, because he had faith, without faith, it's impossible uh, to please God. But if you have faith um, and believe that he is God, he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. This is the reward as Enoch for the pre-trib, those in Luke, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, their reward is from diligently seeking him in faith. They're the ones in Christ's spirit filled. Then we have the Noah portion, which relates to the 40 days. This group of workers who are here with the Lord for 40 days and then will remain during seals. This is that portion. And then what do we have? It's Remember this? It's the story of Luke in order, which is something we're also going to be touching on again. Because, and not in all of it, but in three and four. Because this this. Noah, uh, uh, sorry, Enoch is the pre-trib, beginning of the 50 days. The Lord returns from the wedding. 
He's here for 40 days, which is the representation of the Enoch portion. Uh, sorry, the Noah portion. And then we have the end of seals. What's the end of seals? It's connected to Abraham. What happened with Abraham? That he should receive an inheritance. What was he just talking about? That Abraham and they would go and spread throughout the earth and they would be multitude as the stars, as the sand of the sea. That's, that's the world. That's the house of Israel scattered and, and all around the world. The Gentiles gathered, uh, um, the Gentiles grafted in with them. And when is their portion end? At the end of seals, the great multitude rapture happens in the midst of the seventh year of seals. And what do we know about Abraham, which is directly connected and related to that time? By faith, Abraham, when he was called into the place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heir with them of the same promise, just like he was talking about. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. How did we know that this is a prophetic typology to the end of seals at the great multitude rapture? Because during the time of seals, as we've taught, we know that the foundations of the temple will be built during the time of seals, but only the foundations by a limited group of people brought in to start building, to start rebuilding Jerusalem after it's attacked and destroyed uh, at trumpets, I believe in 2024, which will happen at the beginning of the 14 years. Only the foundations will be built as we've taught many times during seals. So what's he coming to do? He's looking for a place where there's foundations. And he's coming with the group as the sand of the sea, the great multitude. That's the prophetic picture. And then, of course, we have Hebrews 11, 11. Also, Sarah uh, uh, herself received strength to conceive seed and to deliver a child. What's that a picture of? Of course, that is the prophetic picture of the Lord returning, the Lord showing up. That's why it, we, when we've shown on this, we show that in Genesis, in order, chapters 1 through 21, in Genesis 21, why do we see Jacob, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, Isaac, being born in chapter 21 right it's the same as our as our whole chapters to years right uh genesis chapter 21 look at where it is it's a prophetic picture of the lord coming at the end in the final 14th year or the big picture 21 as we shared in the last video it's a prophetic picture it becomes so clear in all of these things but you must first understand the differences in the gospels and and, and the 14 is to understand this timing. So just like Luke in order, which is chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, we have 1, we have 2, which is the 40 days, we have 3, which is a prophetic picture of his coming at the end of six years of seals, and we have 4, which is when he comes and returns feet down. What was he just talking about? He was talking about the Messiah ben Joseph and a time when a group of people would be gathered back together as Abraham, as the sands of the sea who had been scattered around the earth. Exactly what we've been able to discern and show many places throughout Scripture. And, and, and um, Hebrews chapter 11 was just a great place because it literally tells us the connection there with Abraham. So that was their task, and that is what they have done. And that is what we find as one of their proofs concerning them. And according to this, there will be another prophet, or another leader, future leader, a Messiah. In Hebrew, the word Messiah, pronounced in one Hebrew, Mashiach. Mashiach is someone anointed, someone who is holding oil, uh, placed on his head, placed on some part of him. Also, even objects can be anointed to be set aside for holy purpose. That is the meaning of anointed, that is the meaning of Mashiach, or Messiah. Someone anointed or appointed or predestined for a certain role. And there will come a leader. The Messiah son of Joseph before the Messiah son of David. And the Messiah son of Joseph will help the ten tribes know who they are and he will initiate the, the uh, combination, the reunion, the coming together of Judah and the ten tribes. And a portion of them will return to the land of Israel. See that? Because it'll be Messiah ben Joseph who will reunite 
who will bring together the ten tribes and the house of Judah with the Jews and reunite them, and a portion of them will go to Israel, will go to Jerusalem. Again, this is something we talk about, right? There's your great multitude that I was saying that's connected in, Dan in uh, Revelation chapter 7 that's directly connected to the great multitude coming in, connected to Abraham, connected to when Messiah comes. Because if you remember, of course, in Revelation chapter 6, when you, when you dig deeper, this is just a, a brief overview with them, but they know that their Messiah ben Joseph, when he comes, he's going to destroy their enemies. He's going to destroy the enemies of Israel. We know that's the Ezekiel 39 war. This is him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals as Messiah ben Joseph. It's the destruction of their enemies. And then what he was talking about with Abraham and the great multitude that no man can number because it's as the sands of the sea. Here is the great multitude where he will be the one taking them into the land. And where do we see this? Check this out. Remember, he said that he would reunite them because remember, the Christians don't know this. The church misses that they have because they're not prepared in Christ, because they're sleeping, as we say. They're not fully understanding. They're not ready. This is why not only is salvation number one, but why what we do in readying a group of people is so important. Yes, a remnant group will remain to work, but there will also be a large portion being taken pre-trip to the third heaven. The Christian, the church doesn't know this. Even those in prophecy don't know this. They don't realize that the church that isn't prepared, they'll tell you there's a whole portion of the church that isn't prepared and won't be ready. And they'll think that they have to stay until the return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives. We know that that's not true. They're going to have to endure the portion of seals. They'll see him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals in the clouds, right, on heavenly Mount Zion, and the world is going to be freaking out. The church has missed that. Why have they missed it? Because the Jews tell us that their Messiah, because remember, most of us know this, and we've shared on it before. The Jews are waiting for unfulfilled prophecy of a conquering Messiah king high priest, like a Messiah ben Joseph, who will destroy their enemies. The temple then get rebuilt. Then he would die in battle. And then Messiah ben David would come. Hello. What does that sound like to you? Absolutely everything we teach from the end of the sixth year of seals to the end of trumpets. Hello? You see, again, this is something we've taught on many times. Look at, when, look at what it said in Isaiah chapter 6. All right? How long, O oh Lord, right? Or, or uh, Isaiah 6 verse 8, the last portion of the verse. Then said I, here I am, send me. And what was, he go, what was he to go do? And he said, go, tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See you indeed, but perceive not. Mark the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Hasn't, haven't you guys read? I know we've covered it before, but have you ever had anybody tell you when you read this, wait a second, if the Jews have been blinded and ears plugged and made heavy so that they can't be healed, so that they can't be converted and be healed, isn't that for our benefit? That was for us. That's why it said in Romans, their fall was to save the world. Who's the world? The house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in like we always say. They've been blinded in part for our sakes. That's why it says it in Luke 19 as well, when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, and now they're blinded that they won't see these things. Why? 
because it isn't Jews, uh, uh, Judah's time yet. It's until the end of the sixth year of seals. It's the time of the world to bring in that portion of Israel, the house of Israel, for which the Gentiles are grafted in because they've been spread out. They are. The Gentiles who are Christians are the house of Israel. That's what it's telling you. That's what he's saying as well. Are there some that might be direct descendants and, and, and the Lord will divide it and let them know at that time? Maybe. But really, in the big picture, just in the, in the upper level, looking down on it, the house of Israel are a bunch of Gentiles. But it's not per se that they are Gentiles. It's that they have no idea that their descendant bloodline is the house of Israel. And so the Jews have been blinded for our sakes that we can be brought back in before they can see. You see? And then he said, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitants and the houses without men and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord had removed man far away, there be uh, far away, and there be a great shaking in the midst of the land. We shared on this not too long ago. But yet in it shall be a tenth and it shall return and so forth, right? Not until it's all destroyed and people are far removed. So people can say, oh, well, this already happened at the time of Christ and the temple was destroyed. Must remember, was, is, is to come. They were blinded for our sakes. And what ends up happening? Christians are blinded for theirs. This is what we're seeing. The Christians can't see what the Jews see that they have known and understood and have had passed down for thousands of years. Because Christ already saved them. Their portion has already happened. Now it's just about them waking up, realizing it, confessing to Christ, selling out to Christ fully because they won't have the rest of their lives to live. Their, uh, their time, their age is over. At the end of seals. Because then it returns to the Jews time. And that is when they recognize him. When he comes as that conquering king. As high priest. Messiah ben Joseph. Melchizedek. And the temple gets rebuilt. So what do we see here in Zechariah 8? What is Zechariah 8? 14 chapters. The prophetic picture as we know of 14 years. Zechariah 8 is a prophetic picture of the beginning of trumpets. We've talked about this many times, and look at what we see here. Zechariah 8, Zechariah 8, verse 3, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. He's going to start bringing them all back. They'll be in the streets. And then what does he say? Verse 8, And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. What was he saying? He was saying then a portion of them will come back to Jerusalem, will be brought back to the land. And maybe that's why, you know, when people say, well, there's there's the house of Israel and there's the house of, of Judah, the, some people will say that, well, Gentiles aren't the house of Israel. Well, they, they kind of have to be because they've been so scattered and spread out. But there may be some pure, more pure bloodlines that the Lord will obviously know. And maybe those are the portions that go to, to Judah. But we know that's not exactly where they all go, right? We know that the great multitude is going to paradise. Where's paradise? On heavenly Mount Zion. Heavenly Mount Zion came. That's what they see coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. And now here he is at the start of trumpets. There's the Lord, the Father, the Son is there. And it's something in the clouds. He's coming with the place prepared. That's why it's in John 14 of 21 chapters. It equals the seventh year of seals. He's coming to receive them to paradise. He's going to rapture the great multitude rapture to paradise, exactly as Paul was prophetically telling us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. And then what does it say in verse 9? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, you that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation which was laid during seals of the house of the Lord was laid that the temple might be built. 
So now let your hands be strong because they're going to start rebuilding the temple, the city, the streets, and the wall. You see, when does it start? First year of trumpets. The world will tell you that the temple has to get rebuilt. Once the temple starts rebuilding, that's the start of the seven years. Mm. You see, they, because they've missed the first seven, and so they mix and mash and combine all this stuff together. They have no idea that it's Messiah ben Joseph, Melchizedek, high priest and king, with the modern-day Zerubbabel, the other anointed one, who is rebuilding the temple, who was the one during seals who lays the foundation. That's why if you're here during tribulation and you see somebody who is in charge in the midst of the chaos, but is in charge of, of overseeing and rebuilding the temple and the foundation is being built, that is your anointed, um, anointed as a Messiah, not the Messiah, but as a Messiah who is the modern day Zerubbabel. And he's going to be the one to build the temple when the Messiah high priest Jesus comes as high priest and king Melchizedek. For before these days, there was no hire for men nor hire for beast. Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. Hello. This is the red horse rider. Neighbor against neighbor, kingdom against kingdom. And then look what it says down here. In verse, uh, let's start in verse 13. Remember what he said? The, the, the tribes of Israel that are scattered throughout the earth, mixed in with the Gentiles. When Messiah ben Joseph comes, who is Melchizedek, when he comes, he's going to bring them in. He's going to gather them back. And Judah, they will be recognized together with Judah. And a portion of them will go to Jerusalem. Yeah, a portion. And where do we know the rest goes? To paradise. Look at what Zechariah 8.13 says. And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah, and house of Israel, because the Christians, right? A curse, curse as Christians among the heathen, and a curse as Jews among the heathen. So will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. You see, here we are at the beginning of trumpets. The temple and everything's about to get rebuilt. Messiah ben Joseph is here, and the rebuilding starts. And who's there? He's addressing the house of Judah and the house of Israel. This is what this guy is saying. It's directly connecting this period of time that he's talking about. And when he comes, when the Lord comes at the end of seals, at the end of the six year of seals, we know here it's this battle in Revelation 17. This is the Ezekiel 39 war. We see that the lamb shall make war against them, against the beast and the ten, and the, and the ten kings. And he's called, look at this. Lord of Lords and King of Kings, but it's all lowercase except the uppercase L and one uppercase K. Not like Revelation 19 when he comes as Messiah Ben David at the end and he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. It's a completely different battle. And we know precisely when this one is. This is the one that the Jews are looking for. This is, this is the Messiah that they're looking for. Their prophecies yet to be fulfilled of of this priestly king messiah ben joseph who's going to come and destroy their enemies first we have the answers guys and it's so powerful to understand but before that happens before that happens the indication certain disasters may overcome them okay let me go may... back a little bit and the messiah son of joseph will help the ten tribes know who they are and you will initiate the the uh combination the reunion the coming together of Judah and the ten tribes, and a portion of them will return to the land of Israel. But before that happens, before that happens, the indication that certain disasters may overcome them. There may be a period of punishment or perdition. We don't know really know what will happen. Are you hearing this? Biblical prophecies indicated and will be conquered, perhaps, and oppressed by others. And then the Messiah, son of Joseph, will lead them, will come, arise, and teach them to overthrow their oppressors, and they will defeat their enemies and take vengeance from them. Also take vengeance on the part on behalf of Judah for those who had oppressed them. There you go. Did you hear that? <laughs> he's he's kind of doing everything in reverse order, right? So he talks about Messiah ben David, which is at the end of tribulation, the end of the 14 years. Then 
He talks about, but before Messiah ben David, there's a Messiah ben Joseph. And then he talks about these things, the Messiah ben Joseph and what he's going to do. And he's going to, to bring the 10 tribes and reunite them with, with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And we know what that is. We know what they're looking for. The church can't understand it. And then what does he say? And before that, and so now he's, he's going, and before that, he just said, before he comes as Messiah ben Joseph, what did he say? There will be destruction, devastation, battles. You see, he understands that the prophecies, what is he talking about when he says that? He's talking about seals. He's talking about seals. He's talking about the tribulation that begins in Revelation chapter 6 with the red horse rider. You can even say pre-white horse rider at the pre-trib escape. And then the seals when the Lord comes as the white horse rider for 40 days. But we just saw, as we read, even in, um, in Zechariah chapter 8, when he said, you, you couldn't do any of these things. You couldn't come and rebuild. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. Why? Because I set everybody against his neighbor. It's the red horse rider. When power, when power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. This is when the Holy Ghost is taken at the end of the 50 days in that above portion. And at Feast of Trumpets, I believe 2024, it will be red horse rider time that begins with the destruction of Jerusalem. And then World War III, neighbor against neighbor, killing each other. And a great sword was given unto him. You see, this is the same thing we've shared on this many times. Look at this here. It's the same thing. I, re, I updated it here with my colors. It's not easy to write with a, with a, 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 a mouse pad, not a mouse pad, but uh, my finger pointer. <laughs> but remember this? Uh, this is from uh, Second Esdras. Uh, chapter 13, starting in verse 29. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth. This is the pre-trib right here, right before the 50 days begin. This is the pre-trib uh, uh, seven months from now. If we've got the year correct, which I believe we've proven we do, we'll, talk, we'll touch on it a little bit more when we get into Ken, but this is your pre-trib right here. And bewilderment of mind shall come on all those that dwell on the earth. This is what Luke 21, 34 through 36 talks about. There's those who will be delivered, never having tasted of death, stand before the Son of Man, who are accounted worthy, and the rest of the world who is caught off guard. Now listen to what it says next. And they shall plan. Why is there a plan? Because remember, from the pre-trib escape, and the world is now in bewilderment, what's going to happen? They don't break out into World War III. Jerusalem isn't attacked right away. Sure, the house of uh, um, northern Israel is, right? Haifa and Tel Aviv will be attacked and destroyed. It'll be a short Middle East war. But that's not the beginning of the 14 years. There's this plan now to when they will make war against one another. That's called the Red Horse Rider. This is Mark 13's discourse. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You see, this is why in Luke's discourse, it says, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then he said unto them, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then in verse 12, he says, but before all these. That's because the but before is the pre-trib and this bewilderment and plan time, which is from the pre-trib escape during the events that take place during 50 days. When the 50 days are over at the Feast of Trumpets, when Jerusalem is attacked, it's the red horse rider and it begins nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And when these things come to pass, and the signs which I showed you before. So he's not talking about what he said earlier in, in, in chapter uh, 13, but even throughout earlier, what he had told them earlier throughout this book. These events will then take place, and these signs that I told you would happen. Then my son will be revealed. When is this? The end of Revelation chapter 6. The end of the sixth year of seals. The end of six years of seals. And when all nations hear his voice, every man shall leave his own land and the warfare they had against one another. And an innumerable multitude shall gather together as you saw desiring to come and conquer him. 
Where is he going to show up? But he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. You see? On top of Mount Zion. This is why by the time the seventh year of seals are, is over and the Lord is there, he's no longer jealous for Jerusalem, and he's there on Mount Zion, the rebuilding will begin. The seven years of trumpets will begin. But when he comes at the end of seals, this is what they're going to see coming. This is why everybody's freaking out at the end of the sixth seal. They're seeing this coming down. They don't know what it is. It's in the clouds. It's going to be, It's just imagine. Imagine the freak out when the, everybody on earth is trying to hide themselves in mountains and in caves and rocks and holes because they're seeing Mount Zion coming down. And Zion will come to be made manifest to all people, prepared and built. You guys all know this. We've taught on it many times. It's why Mark's uh, portion in the resurrection story, well, in the going to the crucifixion, when he has the meal, he says, a place prepared, uh, uh, a place furnished and prepared. There's a reason why Mark says that in the differences in the Gospels. And that's because Mark's is a prophetic picture of the end of the sixth year of seals when the Lord is coming. And when he comes, it's the seventh year of seals, which in the big picture of 21, like John's 21 chapters. And we see Jesus comes. He says, I go and prepare a place. And when I return, I will receive you unto myself that where I am there, you may be also. It's exactly connected to this. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, a place prepared and built, which is paradise where they're going. As you saw, the mountain carved without hand. And as for you seeing the storm, this is when he reproves and all those that are coming to fight against them. As for you seeing, listen to this. This is what the rabbi is talking about. I, mean, uh, I believe he's a rabbi. And as for you seeing him, gather to himself another multitude that was peaceable. Listen to this. These are the 10 tribes. You see? The 10 tribes that the Gentiles are grafted into. These are the 10 tribes which, are led, which were led away from their own land into the captivity of the days of King Hosea, whom Shulamanser, the king of the Assyrians, led captive. Okay? We're, you're going to hear this talk. So what was this? Well, this was a was. But remember, a was, is, is to come? Did, did the Lord come on heavenly Mount Zion, a place prepared, a mountain carved without hand, when they were taken away by... Uh, by Shulamanser, king of Assyria, of the Assyrians? No. The Lord hasn't come down yet on heavenly Mount Zion, the place prepared, a mountain carved without hands. It's prophecy. So this is still in an is to come, even though it has a typology in things that took place. So this is why you see this is the end of the sixth seal. This is the middle of the seventh year of seals. When the ten tribes will then be taken, what does he do? Remember what he does? We come down here to verse 47. The Most High will stop the channels uh, of the river again so that they may be able to pass over. Therefore, you saw the multitude gather together in peace. What did they do? Pass over. Like Passover? In the midst of the seventh year of seals? About six months into the seventh year, he's going to cross them over at the time of Passover, the second day of Passover. That's the great multitude rapture, when he's going to bring them to the place prepared and built. Just like Joshua from Moses brought them over when they passed over the waters, right, passed through and brought them into the promised land. What happened with Abraham? The same connection this this uh, this Jewish guy's talking about. What was it with Abraham? And they passed over, and Abraham was looking for the place that had foundations. All of this timing is Messiah ben Joseph, who is Melchizedek, the high priest and king. And they will conquer their oppressors, and they will begin, initiate the reunion with Joseph, and a portion of them will return to the greater land of Israel. That stretches from the Nile to the Euphrates, and encompasses, encompasses a good portion of the Middle East. And also eventually will stretch out and take in, His Holiness will stretch out and take in areas of Western Europe, so that they too will be incorporated in the greater land of Israel. This has been prophesied. They have been prophesied that in the period of Messiah, on the period of Messiah, 
son of Joseph, Mashiach ben Yosef, also known as Messiah, Mashiach ben Ephraim, the son of Ephraim, descended from Ephraim. So see, now he's going in and talking about how some writings have him as Messiah ben if Ephraim, right? Messiah ben Ephraim, but you'll see when it's Messiah ben Ephraim, some may say, or Messiah ben Joseph, it is Messiah ben Joseph. It's the same thing. They'll say Messiah ben Joseph, son of Ephraim, you know, same thing. It's the descendant line, Messiah ben Joseph through Ephraim, which is exactly why, lo and behold, we were able to show this in Scripture before we knew that these guys were looking for him as well. Look at what we see. Remember Jeremiah 31? Watch this. Let's start in verse 6. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon Mount Ephraim uh, shall cry, Arise ye and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. Wait a second. You notice what you have here? You have watchmen from the Mount of Ephraim. And what are they saying? Arise and let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. Well, that sounds kind of familiar too, doesn't it? What if we go to Psalms 24? Look at why Psalms 24 makes a difference. Here's our chapters to years. We go to Psalms 24. Look at where we are. It's a prophetic picture of the end of the sixth year of seals. They're crying, saying now is the time because they're seeing him coming. And they were the watchmen. Remember, we keep saying the watchmen, the workers during the time of seals are a portion of Ephraim and a portion of Dan. Dan has two portions, a good side and a bad side. We'll get to that in another teaching. We may touch on it briefly, but not really. But you see, we've taught on it many times. It's Ephraim and Dan. And here are these watchmen now saying, connected to seeing the Lord coming at the end of the sixth seal on heavenly Mount Zion, saying, come on, we got to go. Let us go up. They're crying out to a group. And who are they? They're the watchmen. And look at what Psalms 24 says. Again, something we've taught on for years with the, with the revelation of the open books. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The fullness of what? The earth. The earth. Well, who, who have we been saying is the earth the whole time? The house of Israel. The house of Israel scattered throughout the whole earth. So the fullness of the earth is the Lord's. The world and they that dwell therein, you see? So who are they? Those that dwell therein, not the house of Israel. So what's it talking about? It's now the time of the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. And look, look at what it says uh, in verse three. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands. Remember, we shared on this. Who are the ones that have clean hands? During the time of seals, they had to make themselves clean. This is why even we see this when we go to Revelation chapter seven. Right. They had to make themselves clean. Look at this. Revelation chapter 7. We go to the great multitude that came in. Who are these that are array arrayed in white robes? Verse 14. These are they that came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white. What did they do? They washed their robes and made them white. What happened? Those who are going to go up to the mountain. What did they have to do? They had to make themselves clean. They had to be made clean. Where were we at? Uh, 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 Psalms. So here's what we're seeing. We're seeing this exact same crying out, who's going to go up? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart hath not lifted up his soul into vanity. Who have we been teaching is the vanity group. Who are those that are part of the, the vain show? The children of light, right? Those that have fallen away, uh, those that weren't ready, right, from the creation in the light. So what is this period of time? It's those who have cleaned their hands, made their robes white for the time of the great multitude rapture who are going to go up to the hill of the Lord, which is heavenly Mount Zion that's coming down. And you've got, the 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 watchmen from Ephraim crying out. And so the ones who are going to get to go are the ones who haven't lifted up their soul in vanity during seals. That's the, the church, the world of the church, the sleeping church, those who are still to come in that will come in during the time of seals. 
They have not fallen into vanity during that time. They turned to the Lord fully and have not sworn deceitfully in these things which are going to be connected to the Antichrist and the beast system. What else? Where else do we see this in connection with a group saying this? Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. For those that don't know, Hosea is another one, 14 chapters. Look at where it is. Hosea 6, a prophetic picture of the end of the sixth year of seals. Psalms 24, a prophetic picture of the end of the seventh year, a sixth year of seals. Here's John chapter 14, the prophetic picture of the seventh year of seals, like the beginning of it. And what do they see? He's coming with the place prepared for them. Hello. So what does Hosea 6 chapter say in the beginning? Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. We just shared on this a couple videos back. Who is this group? These were the seals workers, the tribe of Dan and Ephraim, the ones who were working during this time, putting their necks on the line. And who are they? They're the ones who were smitten and torn and beaten. Some of them were killed. And after two days, which means after the 2,000 years are over, who's the group that gets revived? Of course, we know they are the, uh, the Church of Smyrna, the ones like the Aquilas and Priscillas who put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. That's how you know it's during seals. And we know, of course, that it's Smyrna that says they will not taste of the second death or be hurt by the second death. There's only one group. It's Smyrna. It's the workers of seals. And who are they? They're the ones who take part in the resurrection when they are raised up to rule and reign with them in the millennial reign. This is why it says after two days, he's going to quicken us. He's going to restore our life. And then in the third day, he will raise us up and we shall dwell in his sight. Who is the he? Of course, it's Christ, as we shared in the previous video as well. It says, uh, Hosea 6, verse 3, halfway through. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the former and the latter rain unto the earth. Who is this? This is Jesus. This is when he's coming as Messiah ben Joseph. Melchizedek, high priest king. Exactly again, as we showed in Joel chapter 2. Here he is. The trumpet from Zion, the holy mountain of the Lord, because it's the end of the sixth year of seals. And we shared how this is the one, the, the former reign moderately, which is teacher of righteousness that the Lord gave first. And then what does he say? He will cause to come down for you, to come down, to descend for you. The reign, the former and the latter reign, which is Messiah. This is the same wording that you have in Hosea. What's Joel chapter two? Like we shared in that previous video, it's the end of six seal crazy right chapter one is the prophetic picture of the 40 days joel chapter two is the end of the sixth seal joel chapter three is the end of uh trumpets in that final year of trumpets all of these things are saying the same time like right along this line the end of the sixth seal to the start of the seventh year all of this all of it connected to the same time he's talking about that he will be from the tribe of Ephraim. And there are also indications that he will, that will have an assistant. Someone will help him from the tribe of Dan. Oh, and I forgot to mention. In this with Jeremiah, in chapter 31, for those that don't know, I know there's a lot of new viewers lately. For those that don't know, not only is this here from Jeremiah 31, 6, showing that it's the end of the sixth seal, and the watchmen are crying out from Ephraim, from Mount Ephraim, saying, you know, let us go to Zion unto the Lord our God. Look what happens in verse 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together a great company, which is what? A great multitude shall return thither. When you go to the, um, for those that didn't know this, when you go to the uh, um, Septuagint, the original translation from the Hebrew, it says that this is going to happen at Passover. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. This is exactly what we show. This is why when we say Deuteronomy 16 is the revelation of the end of days. The pre-trib is at the true feast of weeks. The mid-trib, they see him coming at the end of six years, but they won't go until Passover in the middle of the following year, the second day of Passover, the great multitude at Passover. And then you have the post-trib, which is the time of tabernacles. It's, it's incredible. The seven-day wedding at the end of tribulation will be the seven days of tabernacles, and the eighth day will be the new beginning of the millennial reign uh, of the Jubilee and the millennial reign. It's awesome. So look at how fitting it is that this is the Lord now coming on Zion. Ephraim, one of the worker groups, crying out to, to go to the Lord in Zion. He's going to gather them in the great multitude rapture at the time of Passover. And listen to what it says in verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Ephraim. Uh, I am a father to Israel. And Ephraim is my firstborn. Ephraim is my firstborn. You see how confusing that must be for people studying scripture? You try to go explain this one to, to your pastors. <laughs> this is a whole discussion, right? Because I thought Jesus was from the, he was, he's the, he's descended through David. How is he going to be Ephraim and David? Right? They can maybe say through the father, right? Through, through Joseph and the adoption and, or through the mother in the other sense, right? Through his mother. And there is connection that way. But there's a greater revelation, and this is why the church can never understand it. Because they cannot yet see. They're blinded to the Jews, and the Jews are blinded to the Christians. We have the tie that binds, that brings them together. This is why it's this is this is why I'm so freaked out by it. We are being prepared, brothers and sisters. There is no doubt about it. We pray to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man, as Luke 21, 36 says. We pray and we watch and, and we diligently seek to be accounted worthy. But when the time comes, we will be prepared if the Lord tells us first, I'm going to a wedding. And when I come back, I want you to be ready. Be at the door that when I come and knock, you'll be ready and you'll open it right away. And when you do, we will dine together. And then what do we know? He's going to open their understanding for the time of the end. And then at the end of 50 days, the anointing of the Holy Ghost will come upon that worker group. And they will be the ones during seals with the modern apostles who will have been chosen as well. Isaiah 31, 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O you nations, and declare in the isles afar off and say, he that scattered Israel will gather Israel him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. What did he say? He said in Matthew 15, I am not come, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is them. This is their gathering of the great multitude rapture at the end of the six years of seals in that seventh year in the midst of it at the time of, uh, at the time of Passover. So awesome. This, all of this is what he's talking about. He started at the end of trumpets. He went to the end of seals. And then he said, there were these events that took place and these things that came against them before this time of Messiah ben Joseph showing up. He has. You see, many Jews have this understanding. But they don't understand the connection. Christians are missing half of this understanding and confuse it with the understanding of what the Jews see because they don't understand the Messiah ben Joseph coming again. Because one of the key things in Messiah ben Joseph when he comes is there's still another period of events coming, which is why Messiah ben Joseph is going to die. He dies in battle. Christians can't understand that. They can't accept, accept it because they haven't yet understood it. 
So that is what we're talking about here. New evidence has come to our uh, attention concerning this. And uh, it began by... Uh, our interest was sparked by a, a query, the queries that we received from Mikhail Klag of Denmark. And then we found an article by Rabbi Baruk Eflati. And so that is what we are about to, to, to discuss here. That from the tribe of Dan will come someone, a person, who, who in his own right will be a type of an assistant Messiah. And he will help uh, the Messiah son of Joseph at first, and also after that the Messiah son of David. So this was really interesting. <clears throat> so this is where I said, we're not. I'm not going to go into everything about the Messiah, uh, uh, about um, uh, uh, the one who comes from Dan, but I wanted to just, just touch on it. Because did you hear what he says? There's going to be one through Dan who's going to help the Messiah ben Joseph. You see, how, do, how does through Dan, the Messiah ben Joseph, uh, uh, Dan, how does he help the Messiah ben Joseph? Well, as the, as the seals workers. As the seals workers. They're there with Ephraim. So see, we have one telling us that it's in Jeremiah telling us that their Ephraim is on the scene. That through the, the, the workers through the line of Ephraim are one portion of the worker group. And then we've got another portion telling us Dan. And Dan is going to help him. Well, when we go to uh, Romans 16, as we mentioned with Priscilla and Aquila, we know that they're going to put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. They're a prophetic picture. And Aquila is who? An eagle. He represents the good side, the overcomer side of Dan. So we've got this picture of Dan worker group and the Ephraim worker group. And they're assisting the Lord. And then you've got the Ephraim group who cries out to gather them to go back, uh, to go to the time of the rapture, to prepare them to get going when the great multitude rapture comes. And you got Dan, who's there, who's assisting Messiah ben Joseph, it says. Well, look at what it says. If he's a picture of Dan as Aquila on the overcomer side, what does it say? Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. It's Dan, the helper in Christ Jesus. Remember in Luke, in Luke chapter 24, who are the ones who represent these workers when the Lord comes for 40 days? And the differences in the Gospels for Luke. Two. Two of them. Two of them on the road to Emmaus. Two of them. Two of them. How many are missing from the 144,000 in the seventh year of seals? Two of them. Ephraim and Dan. Joseph steps in for Dan. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, Joseph steps in for Ephraim and Levi for Dan. Hello. Two of them. When we go to Mark, Mark 16, we see that in uh, 16 verse 12, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them. The, this is that worker group. Those remnants that are still alive, that didn't get killed, some of them will, will live. And what do they do? They come to this group, right? They, they came to warn this group, the 144, that it's the Lord. He's come. And this is a representation, as we've shared over the years, of the 144,000 at the end of six years of seals. And who's telling them? The two. The two. We go to Acts chapter one. Who was it? It was the two. It was just the two disciples. They represent Dan and Ephraim, brothers and sisters. There's no doubt about it. And now what is he saying? What's he saying about Dan? He's saying Dan not only helps Ephraim, uh, uh, not only helps uh, uh, Messiah ben Joseph or, or son of Ephraim, right? That, which is why Jeremiah 31 said it at the time of the great multitude rapture, that Ephraim is his firstborn, because it is now Messiah ben Joseph, who is his son Ephraim, who is the high priest and king, in that prophetic picture, and who is the Melchizedek now. So who helped? Ephraim, and there he is crying out, and Dan. There's two. And then what did he say? Dan also helps out 
Now, I don't know where Ephraim, if Ephraim does, but I assume Ephraim does as well. But this context that he's talking about is more info that came in just on Dan. I'll bet you there's some on Ephraim as well. But All right, so my internet just crashed, but I'm back. So I'm going to continue recording. So I left with saying uh, that I'll bet some uh, that I'll bet there's some on Ephraim as well. So the the main focus, though, as I had mentioned, is that the conversation there is Dan. So we've got this info in Dan. So how is it that Dan now comes to take part in helping Messiah Ben David? Well, this is what we were seeing in Hosea chapter six when it said that after two days, he will revive us. Who are the group after two days that are going to be revived? We know it's the ones who represent the workers as Dan and Ephraim. And even though, as I said, we may not see Ephraim fully yet, we can see for sure Dan. And what do we know about Smyrna connected to the two that are representing the workers? We see that it says in Smyrna in Revelation 2.11 that, they should not be hurt by the second death. We go to Revelation chapter 20. Who are those that take part in the resurrection? Who gets to take part in the first resurrection? Those who didn't take the mark, worship him, and so forth, right? They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead live not until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. These are the ones from Hosea chapter 6 saying, let us return to the Lord and he will revive us after two days. This is the group at the end of 2,000 years. They're going to be part of the resurrection. And what does it say? Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a 1,000 years. Okay, this is them. To reign, to be sovereign, right? You're a judge. You, you reign over the people. This is that group. So we know the connection to Dan. This is what he's talking about here in saying that Dan, in this new info that's coming to them, Dan has a part in it, not only with Eph with Messiah ben Joseph through Ephraim as high priest, Melchizedek, and so forth, but he also has a part with Messiah ben David. And we can show that through those who take part in the resurrection who were part of Smyrna, who were his worker group, who will be those who will rule and reign with him in the, their resurrection, that take part in the first resurrection, that will be with him for a thousand years. Guys, the Jewish perspective is, is, is so much, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's so much more than the Christian one, because it, it's not really. Their, their real focus is when he comes at the end of six years of seals, Whereas Christians know there's this tribulation of the seals, and mind you, he knows it, so the Jews know that there's this, this devastation and all these things and captivity that happened to the house of Israel during the time before Messiah ben Joseph comes, but that's where the Christians have more insight. The only thing is, is that the Christians through the church, they take that of seals and they throw it into the seven years, which is connected to Judah, because they all learn from the gospel of Matthew. So do you see why this is so powerful? The overall picture is better here, but very high level. Events happen to them first, then Messiah ben Joseph, then when Messiah ben Joseph, things happen, and then I'm going to show you later at the towards the end the other portion of this and what we know happens to Messiah again as Messiah ben Joseph, and then when Messiah ben David comes. You see, the church doesn't understand that portion, yet they believe it's temple first, then Antichrist steps in, and then Great Tribulation mid-trumpets. You see? I love that we can understand these things, guys. We have been so blessed. It just, again, I know I keep saying it, but I can't, I can't, uh, I can never overemphasize how powerful the information is that we have. We have the open books. Doesn't mean we know everything but we know more than has ever been made known before. It's, it, it, it's incredible. So now from this Jewish perspective, we're now going to go into a Christian perspective 
from a Christian uh, prophecy teacher, and he really likes you guys. Many of you guys know him, Ken uh, Johnson. I've sent, uh, I've reached out to him many times. I've never heard back. I'm sure some of you guys have sent stuff too. Um, but I, what I said earlier, you know, I had sent to this guy. Uh, when I sent to this rabbi, I sent him those last two videos, the uh, four messiahs, uh, coming four messiahs, and Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben David. So hopefully, I told him it was a, Christ a Christian uh, sending it with this revelation that would line up with what he's trying to understand, and it would explode. Boy, if he could grasp or take the time to watch those videos and study them out, man, oh man. You know, <laughs> I hope and pray, but, you know, am, am, am I expectant? Not really. But who knows? With what happened with Ivan and, and you know, this this draw of what's happening with people, maybe it'll start. Same with Ken, man. It would be great to to have people take the time to 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 see who have a bigger voice than we do and maybe reach more, right? Help us prepare a larger group. So this one I really looked into because it's connected to Melchizedek. All right. So that's why I was emphasizing, you know, Melchizedek isn't just the, the Melchizedek high priest and king, you know, just as as the scripture. So the Christian perspective with Ken, as you're going to understand, everything he's going to see connected to it, relating from the Essenes and from the, the scrolls, from uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, he sees this as them having understood these things about 100 years or so before Messiah shows up. And then these things taking place. But you're going to see there's clearly some confusion within it because he's seeing it in, in when Christ came and fulfilled these things. But you're going to see within the wording, there's no way that these things were all fulfilled in connection to when Christ came the first time. Was he the Melchizedek? Yes, he was proclaimed to be Melchizedek. Well, he was proclaimed, but it was a spiritual thing. Because he was not sitting, he was not ruling and reigning on the earth as Melchizedek. He was not in Zion as high priest and king. He was spiritually these things. The Jews are waiting for the actual one. Before they would come to their Messiah because the spiritual one was for us. When he comes at that point, it's to take home that group and to be then revealed to Judah. But the Christians can't see it because they've heard of these things that must happen. And most can't relate that the Melchizedek high priest is the Messiah Ben Joseph who's coming, who is the former Joshua type. They're the same ones. So let's have a listen to this and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, at this point, it's interpretation. So the interpretation of this particular... Let me see. Maybe I'll slow it down just a little bit for you guys. Ken speaks very slowly, so two is usually easy to listen. These two verses about the Jubilee year and debts being forgiven. The interpretation pertains to the end of days. Okay, so at the end of uh, their age, Messiah is going to come establish the age of grace. There, you see that? Right off the bat, when it says at the end, uh, 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 at the end of the age, right? It, he didn't even say at the end of the age. Let, let's hear that again. Let me make sure I got the wording right. So look at this. It says, um, at this point, it's interpretation. So the interpretation of this particular, these two verses about the Jubilee year and debts being forgiven. The interpretation pertains to the end of days. Okay, so okay. At the end. Pertains to the end of days. So the interpretation of this year of Jubilee and free to return home is to the end of days. Well, where does he, where, where is, where's Ken putting it? He puts it to when the Essenes had written about these things and that the end of their age was the 2,000 years before Christ shows up, <clears throat> for which we're in grace for the next 2,000, and then you've got the millennial reign. So he believes that their writings were pertaining to the end of days when Christ showed up. That's not what was being written about. That is 100% not what was being written about. You see, but where he can go and make some associations is when Jesus said these things, when he was proclaiming these things. And so he sees it as, as the Essenes, who were a hundred and so years before, a hundred and change years before, 
that they were foreseeing and understood these things that when Christ came, he would fulfill these things. But he didn't. It wasn't the end of days. But this justification is that it was the end of days for them to when Christ finally shows up on the scene. Because it was like the end of that age and the start of another. But it wasn't the end of days. Because the interpretation pertains to the end of days. That was not the end of days. And this is why I'm telling you, they can't fully grasp it. And even though it was in part when Christ was here in a spiritual sense, it wasn't fulfilled in the end of days understanding. This is why the church, even those in prophecy with deep roots and in, in digging into prophecy, haven't been able to understand because they don't understand how Messiah is coming as high priest King Melchizedek, who is Messiah ben Joseph. Listen to what it says. Moses said, in the year of Jubilee, each of you will be freed to return home. In the Jubilee, each of you will be freed to return home. Did that happen when Christ was there? Did that happen in Luke chapter 4? You see, in Luke chapter 4, this is where I said we were going to be talking about Luke in order. And we'll, we'll get to it a little bit more as Ken says, uh, uh, shares some more things. But when Jesus says these things, in Luke 4, verse uh, 18 and 19, in verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. He never finished the last part. So when Jesus says this, what was the acceptable year of the Lord and the year of his vengeance? Did this take place? <laughs> Excuse me. No. Because it wasn't the time of the vengeance of the Lord yet. He was proclaiming a jubilee, as we have taught, right? We know that he proclaimed it was a jubilee, and we've shown that it was connected to that time of 28, 29 AD. Which means he's making this proclamation for this timing in this 28 to 29, which is exactly where we have the jubilee. And when we did this jubilee count, knowing what we've revealed from it, Look what happens when we get to the count, as we've shared many times recently. It happens what? It's supposed to happen after the 49th year. Well, that's exactly what happens. There's the new jubilee of year one in 88, 88, 90. Seven Sabbaths. The end of days, the 14 years. The 14 years are the last seven of the 49. And what do we know happens in the 49th year? It goes to atonement. The final 14th year of tribulation goes to atonement. It's one year plus 10 days, as we saw from uh, the, the days of Noah. The final 14th year is Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, is the final year when the Lord has returned. It'll be as it was in the days of Noah. And it's a year and 10 days long because on the 10th day, which is atonement, they sound the trumpet for the year of Jubilee, which is the Isaiah 61, 2, uh, verse 2 and 3. But when we go to it, look what it says. So we got the count of the years in Luke chapter 4 by knowing Luke chapter 3 said, now in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar's reign. So if we go to Tiberius Caesar's reign, look at when it was. For the non-inclusive year method, Tiberius Caesar's 15th year of his reign was 29 AD on the Roman calendar. Hello? You see? Was what? 29 AD. 28, 29, because we go from fall, right? Look at what it said. Look at this. On other calendars in use in the empire, most of which began the year sometime in the autumn the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar would have been, look at that, 28 to 29 AD. Hello. When was Christ declaring it? In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. He was making the declaration that it was now at hand, which means, there you go. You understand that if it was actually this year, in the 28, 29, then the 14 years would have begun last year. 
This is how we know the timing of when he was declaring it. He was declaring that it was now at hand because it was the following year coming. And look what happens. When we did that, we did the full year count. Every Jubilee from the Sabbaths all the way through. And the final Jubilee is right here, which has the 14 years starting at the Feast of Trumpets 2024 at autumn. You see why we're so excited for 2024? And we know that there's 50 days that come first. Telling you guys, this is on fire. This is so exciting. You see, in Luke 23, uh, uh, sorry, in Luke 4, when Jesus said that, you notice that he never included the year of his vengeance, right? So what was it? Uh, Isaiah 61, verse 2 and 3. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and he shut the book, right? And the day of his and the day of vengeance of our God. Remember, he closed the book right here. Right here. But he didn't complain. What he didn't pro, uh, uh, he didn't proclaim this. Why? Because it wasn't the end yet. But in Luke, in order, we get the prophetic picture to the understanding of it. Guys. It's the Jubilee related to the end of days. Let's keep listening. End of uh, their age. Messiah is going to come, establish the age of race, and he's going to do something, okay? So the interpretation pertains to the end of days. The captives that Moses speaks of, so those people that are uh, captive because they didn't pay their debts, well, they're in a debtor's prison, basically. Well, they go free at a certain point. So the captives of whom Moses is speaking are the same people whom Isaiah says, and this is a quote out of Isaiah 61, to proclaim freedom to the captives. Now, remember, Jesus quoted this in, I believe, Luke chapter 4. He said, this is my fulfillment, the fulfillment of me. I've come to let the captives free, to uh, heal uh, the brokenhearted, recovery of sight to the blind, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So this is that quote. Us, right? So Jesus is saying in Matthew, in uh, Luke 4, this is fulfilled today in your hearing. I have come to fulfill this. And the Essenes are saying that particular verse is fulfilled when Messiah fulfills it, but it's referring to the Jubilee year when all debts are forgiven. Well, what kind of debts did he forgive? You know, because some of us aren't indented, indebted in money. So it goes on and says, the captives that Moses speaks of are the same people that Isaiah says to proclaim freedom to the captives. Its interpretation is that the Lord, God the Father, will assign those freed to the sons of heaven and the lot of Melchizedek. So this is interesting. Uh, you see, its interpretation is that the Lord will assign those freed of the sons of heaven and the lot of Melchizedek. And the lot of Melchizedek. A portion of those given to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is at the end of seals, right? He's here during trumpets. It's not you're, you're, in, you're a slave basically to your sin nature or to you're in a debtor's prison. So somebody's bought you apparently or paid the debt or something. Now you're no longer in prison, but you're a slave basically to Melchizedek. Something interesting has happened. So you've went from one authority to another authority. So, uh, and this is interesting. Its interpretation is that the Lord will assign those freed to the sons of heaven and the lot of Melchizedek, even those whose Listen teachers had deliberately hidden and kept secret from them the truth about their inheritance through Melchizedek. So there are... <laughs> Did you catch that? Soon as I heard this, I caught it right away. So remember, we're in the time of Melchizedek. So it's the end of days that it's pertaining to. It's going to the time of Jubilee, which is the end of tribulation. But prior to, in the, in the last year of seals, and throughout the, sep the, the sixth of the seventh year of trumpets, it's Melchizedek's time. Melchizedek, high priest and king, Messiah ben Joseph. Who do we know is now working for them during this time? Who's working for the Lord during this time? Well, for that, we can go back to Mark 16 that we were talking about. Here's the seals workers, as we said, that now come to them, to the prophetic picture of the 144,000. And what does Jesus do to this group? Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven. Remember, it's a prophetic picture of the 144,000 as they sat at to meet. So they were already eating. So it's not the first watch group. It's the second watch group, which is during the time uh, from the end of seals, which is the 144,000 who will work during trumpets. And they sat at eat, and he unbraided. He railed on them for their unbelief and, heart, uh, and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. They didn't believe the account from the two who were working during seals who were coming to tell them to be ready, the Lord's coming. 
So the Lord comes, and when he comes at the end of the six years seals, destroys the enemies, what's the first thing he does? Well, we know there's his workers that were there. Let us go to the mountain of the Lord. He will revive us, right? And then what do we see in Revelation chapter 7? The 144,000 sealed. This is the second watch group, as we've shared many times, in Luke chapter 12. And look at what we see. First of all, again, we, we shared this just not too long ago in relation to, to this, always this, a little bit of a beatdown that this group takes for their disbelief, for not being ready. And we saw it right here in Luke. So this is the Luke uh, uh, 24 group. And when he returns from the wedding, that they'll be ready, open immediately. He will sit down to eat with them and serve them, just like he does in Luke 24. And then there's a second watch and a third watch. And then he talks about, you know, if the thief or the good man of the house had known what hour, what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken in. So be ready always for you not, not the hour the Son of Man comes. Peter says, are you saying this to us or to everybody? And then he goes on and says, blessed is that servant whom his Lord cometh so, shall so find doing. Of a truth, I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. Now listen to this. Verse 1245. But and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day that he looks not for him and an hour when he is not aware and he will give him his appoint, uh, appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. This is related to this same group that gets berated for not being ready at the end of seals who are going to be working for the Lord, his servants, during the 144,000. You see, look at what it says, the Lord of that servant. It's from the second watch group. And how do we know? Because the Mark group of Mark 16, representing the 144,000, they're working trumpets. So when the Lord comes, watch this. At the end of trumpets, immediately after the tribulation of those days, here comes the Lord. We know it's the day and hour no one knows. Okay, there's the day and hour no one knows. It's the Feast of Trumpets. It, at the beginning, right, at the end of 13 to the very beginning of the 14th year, it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. And then it says, Watch ye therefore, for you know not the hour when the Lord cometh, but know this, if the good man of the house had known uh, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken up. Sound familiar? Therefore be ye ready also, for in such an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh, uh, who is a faithful and wise servant, that the Lord shall make him rule and give him meat in due season. Blessed is that servant. Now listen to this. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. All of these things are the same things from this conversation in Luke. And it all pertains to the second watch group. You know why it doesn't pertain to the third watch? Because the we first of all, we know the first watch clearly. And the third watch is the 12 tribes that rem that's in relation to the ones who work as the gates during the, the millennial reign. They're the workers who go out, not the ones resurrected, but the workers of the tribes who go out, who will bring people in to the Lord and direct them in teaching of his ways during the millennial reign. This is the second watch group. This is why they're here. The same conversation is mentioned about them at the end of Matthew's discourse, because it's the end of the sixth year of trumpets and the Lord's coming feet down and he's coming on the day and hour. No one knows the feast of trumpets, 13 years from feast of trumpets, 2024 after 13. So the start of the 14th and we have the same conversation. Blessed is that servant when he finds so doing uh, verily, I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Now listen to this. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to drink and be drunken, that servant, you see, will have part with what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we're seeing <laughs> this, this connection of, again, this something happening during the time of trumpets with his remnant, uh, with, the, with his workers of the 144,000. That, that something happens to one or to some of them. And this is what we've been saying is the reason why. Because when he comes 
as high priest and king. What do we know he's going to do? We know when he comes as high priest and king, Melchizedek, who is Messiah ben Joseph, that he must die again. But he's not doing it for sin of the world and for the sin of the Jews. He's doing it because of the priestly line. The priestly line, who are the 144,000 with Messiah ben Joseph, who is the high priest Melchizedek, they haven't had their atoning sacrifice yet. He's the bull. He is the ox. This is what we know is happening. And so why is he going to do it? Because some will fall away. This is what we've covered again. This is, this is the revelation of the end of days and why we have this in Hebrews chapter 6, verse um, 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the, of the heavenly gifts and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Remember, the 144,000 are chosen by the Lord. They're sealed with the name of God written in their foreheads. And they were there on Mount Zion with them in Revelation 14. These are these partakers. What does it say about them? If they shall fall away. Isn't that exactly what we were just talking about? We see them there. To renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, which means what? To re-crucify and put them to an open chain. This is that group. There's a portion of them for which the Lord must die again because the priestly line is a separate sacrifice than the lamb for the rest of the people. And so what did it say? We're starting to see what the issue is that happens in the end of days to this group. It says, even those whose teachers had deliberately hidden and kept secret from them the truth about their inheritance through Melchizedek. You see what's happening? This I noticed right away, as soon as I saw this. During the time of Melchizedek, it is the 144,000. So the group that would be deliberately holding this would have to be the portion of those teachers, the remnant, uh, uh, the workers of the 144,000 who are deliberately keeping a portion of these teachings about their inheritance that's coming at the end, which will happen in the Jubilee. You see, when is the Jubilee? <laughs> The Jubilee is at the end of the 14 years plus the 10 days on atonement. So where are they working? They're working during trumpets. There's a, there's a falling away of some. One, some, I don't know how many. But it would appear from this that what we can see is that they've deliberately hidden and kept secret the truth about the inheritance that, that, the, the, that the people during that time are to be taking part of when the Jubilee comes and the tribulation is over. I thought that was fascinating. We get another little glimpse into what this group may be involved in, in this punishment for what they're doing. It's prophecy, guys. It's not a was or it's not an is from the was into the is this is is to come. Even those whose teachers had deliberately hidden and kept secret from them the truth about their inheritance through Melchizedek. So you know what would happen? Ken, as a Christian, not knowing that Melchizedek is coming, is seeing it in Christ who already fulfilled it. So he would say the Pharisees and the Sadducees are hiding these things and, and did all these things to speak against Christ. Which, of course, is true. But we already know it was hidden from their eyes. So that we could come in. Which, again, tells us there's still another prophetic portion for them. And it's the time when Melchizedek comes. 
I find this so fascinating. Hopefully it's blessing you guys too. There are some Jews in this day that have been lied to by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, been told Messiah is just a ruler that pops up and he wins a war and hands control of the nation to the Sadducees or Pharisees or somebody and dies. And... Did you hear that? Let me replay that piece for you again. Did you hear what he said? That the fa Sadducees and uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have said, ah, oh, he's just a man. We're waiting for the one who, what did he say, Melchizedek, and that he would come and he would do this and then he would die again and that he would die, in a, that he would die in battle. Hello? That's exactly what we're saying. Sorry, I'm yelling in your ear. That's exactly what we're saying. A Christian can't see it. Unless they've been given these eyes to see the prophetic understanding of the end. That's why the Jews are blinded for us. And when it's over, it goes back to them. And it's the prophecies yet to be fulfilled. It's this dispute. It's this dispute that has taken place over the last 2,000 years over Christ. But it was on purpose. It was on purpose. It's not that these Jews will have that, that they won't have this portion. They absolutely will. They absolutely will. Do you understand the power in these revelations to unite the church and the Jews, the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in the world and the Jews to bring both of these portions of their teachings together in clarity? Man, it explodes my mind. Listen to what he says. Deliberately hidden and kept secret from them the truth about their inheritance through Melchizedek. So there are some Jews in this day that have been lied to by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, been told Messiah is just a ruler that pops up and he wins a war and hands control of the nation to the Sadducees or Pharisees or somebody and dies and he's no virgin birth, nothing miraculous, everything's fine. And uh, no, apparently that's a lie, according to a scene theology. They have been lied to by these Pharisees. Uh, they don't understand that by accepting uh, a gift that Melchizedek, Messiah, gives them. They have their debts forgiven. So really, really interesting. So let's keep reading this. So even those people can be freed. So, and we have people like that today, people that have been taught Messiah is not real, Jesus is not Messiah. Even those people can be saved. And he came to die for the sins of everyone, as it's going to say here in a minute. Um, okay, so the Lord will cast their lot amid the portions of Melchizedek. So we inherit something from Melchizedek, the gifts that he gives. Who will make them return, and that's the Shuva, to either return or to repent. He will make them repent and will proclaim freedom to them, to free them from the debt of their money problems? No, from the debt of all their iniquities. So somehow Messiah, Melchizedekian priest, the one final one, when he comes, he frees everyone from the debt of their sin, their iniquities. <laughs> Man, I love it. I love it. That's why I was so pumped when I saw that he had this video with Melchizedek. Our, uh, our brother uh, Roy sent me a link that had these, because uh, Ken Johnson goes through all of these, uh, all of these scrolls, right? He's written books on these things and everything. Man. Could we ever explode it if he came to listen? Because did you hear what he was talking about? What was this guy talking about? When Messiah ben Joseph comes? When Messiah ben Joseph comes, who is Melchizedek? What's he going to do? He's going to also proclaim this, this freedom. Not, not, the, not the Jubilee time yet, but when he first comes. See, he's talking about when he comes as Melchizedek. He's going to free a group of people. Isn't that exactly what happens at the end of seals? And then the Jews recognize it. The Jews recognize their Messiah ben Joseph. And that's what we saw in, Ze in Zechariah chapter 8. At the start of trumpets. In trumpets there they are at the start. They're, they're about to rebuild. Let your hands be strong. You got the house of Israel. Now you got the house of Judah there. And then when that time is over. It's the final jubilee. Of the end of days. Just like Isaiah 6 uh, verse 1, 2 and 3. So awesome. Their sin nature. Now that's amazing. Even those people that have been lied to about him, he still came to save them. So very, very interesting. So here we have so far a Dead Sea Scroll saying that the Jubilee uh, ritual of being freed from your the debts that you owe is a prophetic picture of what Messiah would do when he comes to free us from our sin nature, which would reconcile us to God. Isn't that amazing? It's better. <laughs> this sure event, now what event? What event are we talking about? Well, the event when Messiah, Melchizedek, comes and does something to free them, free us of our sin nature and change us from being in prison to sin to being a part of the lot of Melchizedek, to be part of his sons or his group, so to be Christians, so to speak. 
So when does this event happen? Now, as Christians, hold on for a second. As Christians, we know that this event happened around 32 AD. Uh, it was Messiah coming to die for our sins. He was crucified on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and he resurrected. And that's what Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, and they entered into the covenant of grace that had the part of the newly begun age of grace. Okay. So this event. Now, now don't be confused by the dates that he's about to give. You know, so he believes that that Messiah, uh, his death and resurrection was in 32 AD. We can prove and have proved scripturally through Luke chapter 3 into Luke chapter 4, based on the 15th year of Tiberius, that in the 16th year then of Tiberius would be the Jubilee. And in that 16th year of Tiberius, because Christ was proclaiming it, that it was about to come, that it was it was arriving in the 15th year and here we have the following year there's the jubilee and when we count this out it brings us to the time that we're in now that i was sharing earlier and look at where it brings us to his death and resurrection you see what most people have missed is the fact that there was one year there was one year before Christ officially began his ministry. Technically, did it start earlier? Yes. Technically, you can say it was about four and a half years. But it really didn't begin until what? So when Christ was baptized, everybody believes that that began his ministry and it was three and a half years. So if you believe that, then you would say 32 AD. That's what Ken says. But we know it's not true. Because John was still around. And the scriptures tell us that we know because John uh, baptizes Jesus, Jesus is still around, and so is John. And they're baptizing and everything. So we know it was about two months before John was taken into prison. And we know that from other ancient writings. We know that John was in prison then for about 10 months. So it was about one full year from Jesus' baptism to John's death. And John had to decrease so Christ could increase. So it wasn't until Christ was killed, because until John was killed, people were still following John, and everybody wasn't solely focused in turning to Christ. John still kept his followers. They still kept coming to him. So once he had died, they then went to follow Christ. That is when the three and a half years of Messiah's uh, uh, ministry, I would say, officially began, though technically it was a year before that while everything was being set up. You following? That's why it works out to about four and a half years, not three and a half years. Without knowing that, you end up in 32 like Ken does. And how did we come to understand this? We knew it through, this came about through the revelation of the end of days. Because we know that it's Messiah is going to be here during the first about three and a half years of trumpets. He's going to rebuild the city and the streets, as we saw in Zechariah chapter 8. The rebuilding begins. He's cut off in Zechariah chapter 11. So that's about three and a half years in. But what happened first? Well, he came at the end of the six year seals. So he's got the seventh year of seals. So he's got one year and then about three and a half. When I realized that, I went back and started going through the, the Gospels and realized that there was one year with John before Christ had officially the three and about three and a half years on his own. And what do we see here? It's the same thing. He deals with this portion for the house of Israel. He finishes that year for them, which is the 144, the, the battle, and then the 144,000 sealed, the rapture of the great multitude. He makes the, the covenant, the, the peace agreement with many nations, which would be, I believe it's the seventh seal. It's a short period of time. And then... There they are on Mount Zion and the city and streets about to re be rebuilt in the temple. So you have one year and then about three and a half years. That's precisely what happened at the time when Christ came. And when you understand this timing of the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, it all makes sense. It all makes sense in the declaration of the Jubilee, which lines it all up it's awesome messiah's death burial and resurrection this event will take place the first week of the jubilee that occurs after the ninth jubilee so let's first figure out their calendar system <laughs> let's listen to that again <laughs> the first week of the jubilee 
that occurs after the ninth jubilee. So let's first figure out their calendar system. They said that there are four ages of mankind. The first three ages are 2,000 ages apiece, and then a seventh 1,000-year uh, period, which is a Sabbath. And so the weekly ritual of the Sabbath points to time. So at the end of their age, which was right at the first coming of the Messiah, so that's at the end of the second age, okay? Each age of 2,000 years is made up of four onas, or four periods. And each one of these are 500 years apiece. 2,000 divided by four is 500. Well, each one of these is made up of 10 jubilees. 10 times 50 is 500. A jubilee is 50 years, okay? So, uh, and this helps settle the whole concept of whether a jubilee is 49 years or 50 years. But anyway, so this is what they're saying. So they're at the end of their age. So they're obviously in age number two and in the fourth una, toward the end of the age, in a that jubilee cycle. And they're looking forward to the 10th jubilee, which is when everything is over, the end of the age. So the event when Messiah comes to free them from their iniquities, to die for their sins, takes place not at the end of the 10th jubilee, which would be at the end of the age, but one jubilee back. Now, if it's 75, as it's calculated out, instead of the end of the... Here, you see that? You're going to hear, he says... So don't get too confused in what he's saying. He, it's just in relation to the counting of the cycles of Jubilees and how the Essenes did it. I'm going to share in an upcoming video, probably in the next one, we go into some of these other parts, that I, I, I still don't buy the, uh, the Essenes calendar. I, I am not sold on it. Scripture tells us the moon is included, and they didn't include the moon. And I'm going to show you what I mean. They you know, where they have from Ken's, from Ken's, uh, from Ken's own uh, website, uh, the Essene calendar and how they count it from the spring equinox and so forth. And when you see this, there's absolutely no connection to the moon. Well, I, I don't see how anybody can look at that and say, well, that's correct. I just, it makes no sense to me connecting the year counts without having the moon. You know, when the 14th day of the first month is Passover and the start of the month is at the new moon, which means that the repairing of the moon, how can you start a month in, in a moon that's a third of the way through, a quarter of the way through? It, it, it does not line up scripturally because they only do it off the sun. And so I'll, I'll share that and explain some of that uh, in, a, in an upcoming video. But in this cycle of them counting their jubilees, they're, they're believing that this count to Christ at this point was about um, when, when Christ came the first time and then that, that final jubilee. So there was a jubilee from 25 AD to uh, 75 AD. And so this is where he gets confused. And you're going to see as we go forward where he's trying to connect this this 75 years from 25 AD to 75 AD with events that happened in 75 AD to try to make it line up that this Jubilee count that he's talking about of the end of days isn't the actual one of the end of days, but is trying to twist it about to make it seem that it was connected to when Christ came. And you're going to see how a bunch of this falls apart because it just doesn't line up. There's, there's prophetic hints. There's little bits of insights, but it absolutely was not when Christ was the high priest and king because he did not yet physically fulfill that. He spiritually fulfilled that. So you only get hints of it, not the actual as this is talking about. So let's let's keep listening. The 10th Jubilee, which would be 75 AD, it's at the end of the 9th Jubilee. That would be 50 years before, right? So 75 minus 50 is 25. So on our calendar, that'd be 25 AD is, is the beginning of the 10th Jubilee or the actual end of the 9th Jubilee. So this says this event will take place in the first week of the Jubilee that occurs after the 9th Jubilee. So one week later, we're talking about a, a Shemitah year, so a set of seven years. So if it's 25 AD plus seven years, 25 plus seven is 32. So according to- So you see, that's how he gets to 32. Believing that if you follow the cycles and it's 25 to 50, those were the, the Jubilee cycle counts, then in the first week, that first seven years of those 49, then there's Christ, and he fulfilled that first week. Their theology, there's going to be a Messiah, with a lot of Melchizedek, that comes to free us from our sin nature. And there's other, script, other uh, scripts that talk about his death being pierced and etc. But he transfers us from being slaves to sin and alienated from God into being of the lot of Melchizedek. And the event that takes place for him paying for our sin nature occurs in 32 AD. Very, very interesting. And so one of, the, one of the people I was asking a question last week was about this, and it's like, well, it seems like the age would start in 32 AD, not 75. Yeah, it does seem like that, but I'm not sure how to interpret this other than that. So it's really interesting. So either way, there's an end of an There, see, so that's also part of my point. You see, he wasn't really sure how to interpret that. How do you interpret that being the end of that age, yet there was still another, what, uh, 
49 minus seven years to go for that jubilee. Yet there Jesus was proclaiming the jubilee. You following what I'm saying? It, it, it doesn't make sense that he's saying there was the jubilee and that the end of this jubilee from 25 was then bringing us to 75. Yet he himself was proclaiming that Jesus had declared the jubilee in Luke chapter four. All you have to do to understand if Jesus was declaring the jubilee there and you know that it was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Hello. You see what's happening? This is why he still has confusion on that. First of all, he's got it in the wrong count, which is fine. It's a few years difference, even though it makes a difference for us. It's it's a several years difference, or I guess three or four years difference, which does matter in in the end of days count that we're talking about now. But it also matters because then these things around it that he's trying to make connect to the year of Jubilee. How on earth does any of this as Melchizedek year of Jubilee connect from 25 to 75? It doesn't make sense. And the reason why he can't he can't fully put it together there is because it's literally about the end of days. In age, you go back 50 years and then go forward seven. That's when the Messiah is supposed to be cut off to pay for our sins. So really. So that was very interesting. Let's keep this going. Oh, it wasn't very much further. Uh, think about this for a minute. The end of the 10th Jubilee should be 75 minus 50 plus seven is when the Messiah dies. So the Messiah's death, 32 AD, takes our sin nature, starts the age of grace, the, the age of grace covenant, uh, the, you know, all these things given the Holy Spirit. So, but now we're talking about in that same time period, all the way to the end of the 10th Jubilee, that is when atonement is made for the sons of- There you go. So here we are following the same context and look at what it says here. Now the day of atonement is the end of the 10th Jubilee when atonement is made. Well, hold on a second. Christ wasn't here if that 10th, end of the 10th Jubilee, which he is saying is 75 AD, Christ wasn't here. Him as Melchizedek wasn't here. And in the previous slide, we saw that it was connected to the end of days in the Jubilee. What do we know about the end of days in the Jubilee? This is what we were talking about a moment ago <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 24, right? It says the coming of the son of man, which in Matthew 24 is the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of 13 years. He's coming on the day and hour. No one knows, which is the feast of trumpets. And that final year it is coming is going to be as it was in the days of Noah. We go to the days of Noah. And what do we know about the days of Noah? The flood begins. On the second month, 17th day. And for those who are wondering, does that mean it's going to begin on, on uh, the second month, 17th day uh, uh, um, in the 14th year? No, it's going to be at trumpets. It's a prophetic picture. So when does it end? It ends in the second month, 27th day. So it's a year and 10 days long. So a year and 10 days, if you go from trumpets to trumpets, there's your year. And 10 days is the Day of Atonement. What happens in the Day of Atonement, guys? Look at what happens in the Day of Atonement. Watch this. Leviticus chapter 25. In the Day of Atonement, in the year of Jubilee, thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years, 49, uh, uh, seven times seven years, uh, in the space of seven Sabbaths of years, shall be 49 years. Then shall thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. It's the proclaiming of liberty in the 50th year. You see, the, the revelation of the open books and all of this brings this clarity, guys. The atoning portion for the day of atonement connected to Jubilee, connected from the time of Melchizedek, takes us to the end of 49. And what happens in 49? There's a sacrifice, right? There's a sacrifice. 
at the end of the 13th to that 49th year? You see, he's going to go on and you're going to hear that then there would be no more sacrifices for the Jews. Well, there wasn't, right? For the last almost 2,000 years. But there is still one more sacrifice that has to happen. And it's directly connected to Melchizedek. It's unbelievable. Heaven for the men of the lot of Melchizedek. So the men of the lot of Melchizedek are those that have accepted. Now the day of atonement is at the end of the 10th Jubilee when atonement is made for all the sons of heaven for the men of the lot of Melchizedek. An atonement? An atonement is made? An atonement is made at the, uh, in the end of the 10th Jubilee when atonement is made for all the sons of heaven? For the men of the lot of Melchizedek. Who do you think those would be? <clears throat> Messiah. And Maybe the 144,000? Maybe the 144,000? <laughs> Why do I say this? Well, remember Hebrews. When even though this group of the 144,000 and this group that kept these secrets and, and, and didn't do these things, and there was a falling away with some of them, and he's, he's given them this berating, we know that the reason for his dying again for them, because they're this priestly line, that there had to be this sacrifice. He's going to save them. Remember, they're the ones that have the Father's name written on their foreheads. They can't be left. That's the purpose of that sacrifice. It's not for the sins of all again. It's for the priests. This all goes back to the teaching when we've talked about um, Aaron. When Aaron and Moses, I think in Numbers 21, 20 or 21, Moses and Aaron, and he strikes the rock twice. They weren't supposed to strike the rock, right? They were supposed to speak to it. Moses strikes it, and then he strikes it again. One strike was, from, was because of Moses, and that was when Christ came the first time in his death and resurrection. The second strike was the one caused because of Aaron. And that's the one that's going to happen in the, again, in the is to come. And have went from darkness to light, or have went from being enslaved to sin to being enslaved to Messiah, which is a wonderful, wonderful privilege. So some sort of atonement is going to be paid for at the end of that Jubilee. So in 75 AD, something happens, okay, uh, for the lot of, of Melchizedek, for us, for believers. This now that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Let's read this again. Now the day of atonement is the end of the 10th Jubilee. When atonement is made, you see, the atonement is made at the beginning of the Jubilee, guys. At the beginning of the Jubilee. Because remember what happens when the Jubilee, when the atonement day of Jubilee, it's day one. You see, or, or the 10th day of the 14th year. You see, it's not the Jubilee yet. It's the 10th day of the 14th year. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. It is the 10th day at the end of 14 years. So there was the 14th year, which is the 49th. And in that 14th year, we know it's the days of Noah. So that 14th year, let me correct that. That 14th year is a year and 10 days. Those 10 days to atonement are part of the Jubilee year. That they're the first 10 days of the Jubilee year to atonement when atonement is made, you see, in that jubilee. So it is the beginning. Those 10 days are the beginning of the jubilee, and the announcement for it is made on the 10th day of the Day of Atonement. So it, you see what I'm saying? It, the reason I had to make sure I corrected that is that so you understood that it is 10 days into the year of jubilee, which is day one of the millennial reign. So what happens in the year of jubilee? The restoration. When the tribes will be brought back that were that at mid trumpets were taken into a place protected, remember? And then they'll return at the end of 14 at the time of Jubilee at the sounding of that trumpet, and they'll be brought back to be given their divisions of land and so forth. So you see, when we understand this, we know that that 14th year is when the Lord returns feet down, Messiah ben David, he has to destroy all the enemies, his he's the 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 tribe of Judah. 
uh, the line of the tribe of Judah, and his garments were dipped in blood of the blood of grapes because it's Revelation 19. It's the final 14th year. And that's why in Luke, he didn't have the, the vengeance of the Lord because the vengeance of the Lord relates to the end at the end in that final 14th year before the day of atonement, which is the 10 days of the beginning of the 15th year, which is the Jubilee. So this is again confirming that the Jubilee is, of course, as we know, at the end of 49, but not just the end of 49, 49 and then 10 days into that year of Jubilee, which, again, just so you remember, is precisely the count from the 28-29 AD. You see, he has it in 25. It's wrong. If it was 25, we should already be in tribulation. This is why it's important, guys. We're preparing a people, brothers and sisters. This is, it says, it is the time of Melchizedek's day of grace. So this is the age of grace or the day of grace, the thousand year period or 2000 year period is the age. Um, and we call that the same thing. Paul calls it that. This is the age of grace. It's called that back in the prophecies of Zechariah in the Old Testament. So really, really interesting. So stopping here for a minute, we know that the Messiah comes to die for our sins, to reconcile us to God, to pay for our sin nature, the debt of our iniquities. That happens in 32 AD. At the end of the 10th Jubilee, which would be 75, there is some sort of atonement that's done. And this is during the time of no. So you see that? Again. So then at the end of 75, because it's the end, because it's got to be at a Jubilee where the atonement is done. How is an atonement done by a Melchizedek who's not there? Melchizedek's day of grace. The age of grace is here. Okay, so this is interesting. So the age of grace, the way this reads, could start there at 75 or could have already start, started, say, in 32 AD. You see? You see what he just said? So it could start there in 75 or it could have started in 32 because when Christ's death and resurrection, that's where you, we know it was 33. But, you know, that is death and resurrection. So, you know, really it started there. I mean, Paul kept saying that's uh, the age of grace. And, well... If that's where Paul was always saying the age of grace, how can we go to 75 and say, well, now there's the time of grace? You see? Because even though there are hints, <laughs> again, I'm going to reiterate, just because there are hints of pieces and hints of it that Christ fulfilled some of these things in the spiritual sense, this isn't what this is actually talking about. We've talked about this before. All of these scrolls are prophetic. All of these scrolls are prophetic. Remember this even when we go to um, Genesis 49? It gives you all of these little glimpses of each of their tribes and their portions. Okay? Judah, lions, well, Levi, Simeon, all this. Look at how verse 1 says. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. For some reason, people... When, when they see this in the last days, they'll, they'll connect it to the end of the was going into the is, as we're seeing Ken do. And when they do that, it doesn't line up. It's literally talking about the end of days. One great example to be able to prove it right out before your eyes. Um, right here in relation to Judah. What happens here with Judah? He's a lion's whelp. Binding the fowl to a vine and his ass to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Did Christ do that? Nope. People will say, well, binding of his fowl to a vine and his ass to the choice vine. Did he? Did he? Or was that the prophetic difference in Matthew's gospel? Remember, in Luke and in Mark of the Synoptic Gospels, there was only an ass. Right? The ass is cold. There wasn't a fowl as well. It was one or the other, or there was a fowl and there was no ass is cold. Only in Matthew do you have both. How come two of them only have one and the other one has two? That would be a huge error in Scripture. It's one of these types of reasons why people say, see, it was written by men. No, it's prophetic. And that's the differences in the Gospels. They are for us for prophecy. He hasn't fulfilled this yet. He hasn't washed his garments in wine and his, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's because this is speaking to us about the end of days. 
And we see this all throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls. They are prophecies to the end of days. There are hints to the time of coming of Messiah. There were little parts and there were pieces within it, absolutely. But the big picture was for a group of people and the teacher in the final generation and this group within a community of people who would be given this revelation through the revelation in the understanding of Scripture. Because there was still one to come in the final generation. This is it, guys. Mind blowing. Which, if we understand Paul correctly, the age of grace started with the church age. It's synonymous. So the church age definitely started in 32 AD. You and see? The... Definitely started in 32 AD. So why is he trying to say, but uh, the, the final portion was 75? It doesn't line up with Melchizedek. But you're going to see what he does try to line up to that time frame, and you're going to see how we connect it at the end. Again, I'm just trying to pull out what these things say. Some of these may be correct. Some of them may be wrong. Uh, and that's for us to determine. But it's amazing that they saw even that, that clearly. And let me correct and let me make sure you guys understand this. I'm not belittling a Ken Johnson. I would love to have discussions on these things with Ken. I think it would be a fantastic, whether privately or in a group setting, I would love to have a conversation with him. I'm just showing you how we can see these prophetic revelations that confirm and bring more clarity to what we have understood and revealed in the end. And that we could show from a from a, a Gentile Christian house of israel perspective that they they can't see how the connection is to the end how there is a melchizedek high priest and king coming yet we can show from a jewish perspective where they were blinded they could see this part that's still coming for them because these things haven't yet been fulfilled really way back when about 100 or so bc so what happens then at 75 ad during the age of grace that is some sort of atonement for the lot of melchizedek what happens? It says, he will, by his strength, rise up the holy ones of God to execute judgment as it is written of him, concerning him, in the songs of David. And we'll stop there. There you go. Listen to that. So it says, it is the time of Melchizedek, in Melchizedek's day of grace. He will, by his strength, raise up the holy ones to God to execute judgment as it has been written concerning him in the songs of David. Hello. Raise up the holy ones. Raise up the holy ones to God to execute judgment as it has been written. When, when's the judgment? The final year. There for a minute. At this point, there's going to be the people that are holy ones of God. Holy ones are saints. Okay. Back in the first century, you were obedient to the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they officially ruled the government under control of Rome. So that's, that's the government. Whether you agreed with their theology or not, you obeyed them. Okay. But they were not considered holy. They were considered well, the reason Rome was there to begin with is because they couldn't govern themselves, and that's not very holy. So they're obe you have to be obedient to them because it's the government, but don't be like them. On the other hand, the Essenes were called saints by the people. They were looked at as being the only ones that really were holy. They were supposedly, according to what was taught about them and everybody believed, Josephus records this, they were the ones, the only ones to whom the gifts still function. They followed the Holy Spirit and still had prophecy and other miracles that happened with them, and they prophesied of coming Messiah. So really, really interesting. So consider that now. Who are the Essenes type? If there was a teacher and a group among them, and there's a prophetic end of days teacher and a group among them through a community who are given the revelations of the end for the end of days, and there's a group being raised up, and it's the time of the Lord's judgment. Remember what happens? Who takes part in the raising up? The ones who are like a prophetic future type of Essenes? Whether you want to call them Essenes or or a group through John, you know, um, I don't know if we had mentioned that a little while ago. I use Essenes because we understand the wording for Essenes. Some will say the Essenes were were a Pharisee type of group, right? And Josephus was a part of them. But there was a group of the Zadok priests. And the Zadok priestly line was this group, not really the Essenes. So whatever way you want to say it. I understand what's being said, but the understanding for most is using this term as Essenes, okay? Knowing that, quote-unquote, John the Baptist was a part of them like we shared. Whether you want to say John the Baptist was an Essene or that, no, the Essenes were that, that bad sect portion, and really it was the Zadok priestly line with um, John the Baptist there and so forth, that's fine. I'm just using this term because it's the term being used and it's the term most people know. So 
we have this same type of group in the end, and we know that there's a group being raised up with the Lord who will rule and reign with him for a thousand years, and it's the time of his judgment. You see? So if we take that to understand, his holy ones could be Christians, okay, but it didn't seem like it was. <clears throat> it could be the Essenes. And so this is where he relates it now to like 75 AD again. When Melchizedek isn't there, the Lord's not there, you see? The Essenes then, or the holy ones of God, rise up to execute judgment as it has been written concerning him in the Psalms of David. As it says, and this is actually a quote from Psalm 82, another one of those Psalms that Jesus quoted during his ministry. I thought it was interesting that all the Psalms here are ones that Jesus quoted as we go through the Gospels. Very, very interesting. So Jesus is either giving us the answers to what those Psalms mean or throwing them up to the Pharisees saying, what do you think it means just to get them to go away and may or may not interpret it for us. But they were fundamental passages that would let you understand if you're a Sadducee, Pharisee, or an Essene. So are you a follower of Melchizedek, the Messiah? And do you recognize who he is when he comes? So, um, by his strength, he will raise up the holy ones of God to execute judgment as it has been written concerning him in the Songs of David, where David says, Elohim stands in the divine assembly in the midst of the Elohim he judges. That's Psalm 82. Or I think King James says the gods. God stands up in the divine assembly in the midst of the gods he judges. Where Jesus quotes that and says, well, if I, you know, if the scripture says that you are gods, why do you look at me funny or judge me when I say that I'm the son of God? So, okay, so anyway, so this is referring to that. Let's go on. He said, above it to the heights return, El, God will judge the nations. And that's a quote of Psalm 7, verses 8 and 9. And also where he said, how long will you judge unjustly and show impartiality to the wicked? And that's Psalm 82 too. And of course, we have there the uh, word Selah. And Selah, if it's a song, is a breath mark, but it means a riddle. So when you're reading the scriptures and you see something, maybe it makes perfect sense and you don't think there's anything else more to it, but it says Selah. It means there's an embedded riddle there, probably prophetic. And so they're quoting this, making sure you understand that there is a riddle there. Okay. So how are we to look at all these? In their opinion, they say it's interpretation. So these scriptures, Melchizedek's day of grace, the holy ones rising up to execute judgment uh, against those that are wicked, that follow Belial, that basically judge unjustly. So this is obviously um, Essenes rising up to do something that somehow judges the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And this should be happening somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 AD as some sort of atonement. Not that it's got anything to do with sin, but a recompense or something is going on. Okay, so they say it's interpretation. Now they're gonna tell us what this means. It's interpretation concerns Belial, that's Satan, okay? And the spirits of his lot who turn away from the commandments of God in wickedness. Now from the Essene point of view. There you go. See, so again, now it's gonna be confusing with him because he's trying to still connect it to 75 AD and trying to assume and assess that it's something connected to uh, the Essenes and speaking up against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so forth. But what does it say? Its interpretation concerns Bilal, which is Satan, and the spirits of his lot who turn away from the commandments of God in wickedness. The time of trumpets is mid trumpets is when Satan is cast down. We know this from Revelation 12. We know this going into Matthew's discourse. We know that when the pit is opened up at the fifth trumpet, which is mid trumpets, that the pit is open. Antichrist comes back. Paul's prophet is still there, and Satan had been cast down. So what do we know in this turning away? It says that uh, the spirit of his lot who turn away from the commandments of El in wickedness. This is exactly what we were talking about. Again, a group within this period of time of the 144,000 who fall away. They fall away from the commandments of God in wickedness. This is it's, it's exactly what we were reading in Matthew 24. It's connected to this group during the time of trumpets, one or a few of them. And who do we know it's directly related to? We know it's in the Gospel of Matthew, and it's related to, um, I think, Matthew chapter 27. What happens? is you remember, see with the 30 pieces of silver? So we have the story of Judas. When we read the story in the Synoptic Gospels in Luke and in Mark, it just says money. It doesn't tell you how much money was given. Only in Matthew's Gospel does it tell you it was 30 pieces of silver. What's fascinating about that? When we go to Zechariah, the chapters to years, we know the Lord, he came at the uh, for the seventh year. There they are at the start of the eight, the rebuilding of the city and streets. Let your hands be strong, right? Because they're going to rebuild the temple. There's year one, year two, year three. So in the midst of the third year where the Lord is there for about three and a half years, which would be a time where the 144 are there, 
we see Satan is cast down, the vintage of old. We see that there are three shepherds uh, cut off in one month. And the Lord says in Zechariah 11, 10, and I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people, and it was broken in that day. When did the Lord make this covenant? He makes it, we saw it would be connected to the seventh seal right before trumpet starts. He made this covenant to begin trumpets with all people, and he has to break it at the midpoint because Satan is cast down. And so how does this connect with, with the reasoning in the differences of the Gospels to Matthew's only being the one that has 30 pieces of silver? Well, it's directly connected to mid-trumpets. Look at what we see, Zechariah uh, chapter 11, verse 12. And I said unto them, if you think it good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. For they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter, give a price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast it into the potter of the house of the Lord. You get it? Mid trumpets connected to this cutting off, connected to this group that that has fallen away or a single portion or or Judas who represents a, a, a portion of people during the time of trumpets who had the commandments of God, who had the ways of the Lord. And turned to go with Satan. It's nothing to do with 75 A.D. It's all prophecy, just as it says. Yeah, that would be the Pharisees and the Sadducees, for sure. So it's a judgment against these guys. Melchizedek, Messiah, will enact the vengeance of the judgments of God, something. And that's where it fragments out. So what happened around 75 AD that could be a judgment against the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Uh, and the and in the same time period, the Essenes rise up and either do the judgment or do something. They're not judged, but they do something for God. So what exactly happens? Well, we understand that in, th in 70 AD, uh, Titus besieged and destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem which stops the time of the sacrifices from that time forward. No more. The destruction and the shutdown of the Jerusalem temple. 73 AD, the, the shutdown of the Alexandrian temple. As far as I know, that was the last of the places that you could sacrifice animals for the last, that sacrificial system. Uh, the end of the age of animal sacrifices or the end of the age of the Mosaic covenant with the animal sacrifices. Uh, but then in 75 AD, we have what's called the Council of Yavne, where the rabbis decided rather than trying to fight or rebuild the temple or go somewhere else and build a temple or anything like that, they made the decision to say that from now on, no more animal sacrifices. It just depends on good deeds until Messiah comes is basically what they ruled. So in 75 AD, it was like the nail in the coffin, so to speak, the final end of the animal sacrifice period for the Levitical priesthood. So that's really significant because at this point then, there is a vengeance by Melchizedek, apparently through Romans, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those that don't accept him. And so you see that? You can see a, a type little shadow, but we know 75 AD really isn't a jubilee but he can connect it to a being a time of the end of animal sacrifices. When did he show it? At the, at the very end of 49 to that time of the Jubilee. Hello. What do we know happens? You see, they would say it's the end of the, the, end of, the, uh, um, of the sacrifices, right? And what do we know happens at the end of the 13th year before that final four, uh, 49th year happens we know the two witnesses are killed we know that the two witnesses are killed we know that messiah had to fulfill the three days after three days and after three nights which we find only in matthew's gospel remember in luke he had to fulfill 40 days as jonah that he would warn them well he never fulfilled that we know that was prophecy for the is to come the 40 days in the in the 50 in the above 14. We see in Mark, he gave them no sign and he left in the ship. That's because Mark's group at the end of seals get no sign. They don't know when the rapture is going to come. When they see him coming on heavenly Mount Zion, they're going to be freaking out. Nobody knows because they don't go till the midst of the seventh year. But in Matthews, it says that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, so shall the son of man be. Well, if he's in three days and three nights, that means... He would come up sometime on the fourth day. Well, three days and a half. You see, this is why the church tells you, oh, no, no, Jesus already fulfilled that. Why is there so much confusion then in whether 
he resurrected on the third day, like it says 14, 15 times in scripture. If he resurrected on the third day, how could it be after three days and after three nights, it says? It's not part of one day and part of another. Those have been justifications to account for three days and three nights. It's because it's prophecy that hasn't yet been fulfilled. Which is proven, as we've shared for the last year, couple of years now, that Messiah with the Zerubbabel type are the two that are here in the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple with Zerubbabel and the Lord being high priest and king, who is the greater one, but they rule between them both, as Zechariah 6 said. They're the two here as the witnesses. And what do we know about Messiah? We know that Messiah must die again. Why? For the priestly line. So that at that final end of the age, where he's thinking is that 73 to 75 AD, where they're coming to the end of the animal sacrifices, what do we know about the end of this age? At the end of tribulation, in that right at the end of the 13th year, we see the two witnesses are killed. Messiah ben Joseph, who we know dies in battle, just like the Jews say. They're waiting because they know their Messiah ben Joseph must die in battle before Messiah ben David comes and returns. You see how incredible it is? But you can't, you can't bring this to Christians. They, they, would, they would throw you out of the church. This is not where we can start with Christians. This is where we can come to with Jews because we're in their portion of understanding. This is why I was saying that what Ivan did was absolutely perfect and beautiful in what he was sharing. That's exactly where we start with Christians. But when we talk to Jews, we can tell them the understanding of this part. And they would say, yes, oh my goodness, how do you know about this? And you say, because I know he's Jesus too. Let me show you. Make sure you have a, a good foundation in these things. Make sure you're understanding these things. Because when you bring this to them, you are going to blow their socks off. This is how powerful it is, guys. It's so incredible. Let me keep going on. Uh, well, I think it's probably getting pretty late now. Let, so let me tie this up. We don't need to finish all of the rest of it. There is more, um, but I'll leave it for now. You're getting the picture. You, you can see my point in that the Christians have a perspective that can't see how there's a Melchizedek high priest, Messiah ben Joseph, coming. How it's possible that he can possibly die again. It makes no sense to them. He's already died once for the sins of all. He has. But not for the, priest, the priesthood. Not for the Levitical line. And that's why it's going to happen. This is why you're seeing these things. This is why I wanted to show this. This two places here of this falling away, this, this turning from the commandments, which means they were the servants of God. They were the Judas types in the time of trumpets. Which means they were his servants, which are the priestly line. So because they cannot be left, he must die again. Which is 100% in line with what they are expecting. So let's finish it off listening to this here. Joseph is referred to as Messiah, sir. Let me slow this down. Of Ephraim, as it is in the Zohar in this passage. And it speaks of someone called Saria. Saria will, will come to help the Messiah, son of Ephraim. And he himself is from the tribe of Dan. Saria is from the tribe of Dan. He is destined to take vengeance and wars against the other nations who would have been at that time oppressing Israel. So this is a and it speaks of someone called Saria. Saria will, will come to help the Messiah, son of Ephraim. And he himself is from the tribe of Dan. Saria is from the tribe of Dan. He is destined to take vengeance and wars against the other nations who would have been at that time oppressing Israel. So this is the future. So here we have Dan helping, Dan being assistance to the Messiah son of Ephraim, to the Messiah son of Joseph in the end times. And uh, so Dan has an important role to play. And Dan will contribute to the forces that enable the Messiah son of Joseph to express himself and save all of Israel. And indications are that in the end times, both the 
lost in tribes, and Judah will be oppressed by foreign forces, by heathen forces, by Edom and others. They will conquer or they will take control of the Israelite nations and will oppress them. And the Messiah, son of Joseph, will lead an independence movement to break free from the oppressors and to defeat the oppressors in war, to take vengeance on them for the oppression that they will have done to the ten tribes and also to Judah, and the, the, to the, the oppression and the bad things that will have done to Judah. The Messiah, son of Joseph, will take revenge on them for that, and also after that he will initiate a reunification between the ten tribes and Judah, the Jewish people, and they will begin to come together. And a portion of the ten tribes under the Messiah, son of Joseph, will return to the land of Israel. The land of Israel, in the biblical terms, meaning the area from the Nile, all the way up to the Euphrates, along the line of the Euphrates, that is, it will take in a portion of Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, a portion of Saudi Arabia, all of the land of Israel, the so-called Palestine, all of Jordan, it will take in most of Syria, all of Syria, it will take in Lebanon, it will take in a portion of Turkey and a portion of Iraq and other nations. All of that will be the future land of Israel, also taking the Isle of Cyprus, all of that will be part of the future great land of Israel, and the Messiah, son of Joseph, will bring a, a portion of the ten tribes back there and reunite with Judah. We'll initiate the reunification of the ten tribes with Judah. End of field. Later, Messiah, son of Joseph, may, according to some sources, he will be killed in war, or he may not. There you go, you hear that? In some sources, Messiah ben Joseph may be killed in war. You see this everywhere, guys. They, some of them say they're not sure. Maybe he's killed in war. Others say, no, he's killed in war. But the general consensus when they speak is that Messiah ben Joseph will be killed in a war. Brothers and sisters, this is precisely what we have understood from the Revelation. What is this war? Watch what happens. Let's go to uh, Revelation 11. In Revelation 11, we see this right here. When the two witnesses have finished, so when they have finished their 1260 days, which is the first half of trumpets, there they are, the two candlesticks, right, the, from the two olive trees. It's the same two from Zechariah chapter 6. Look at what it says. The, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, so this is the Antichrist who comes back, at mid trumpets, which is at the fifth at the fifth trumpet, it says, "What does he say? Shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them." How long is this war? Most people don't understand. They might think, "Oh, it's just a quick war. Boom, kills them." No, it, they're not killed immediately after the twelve hundred and sixty days. This war lasts, as we saw, until the end of the sixth trumpet, when the two witnesses are killed. We know this is revealed to us in Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 12. Again, something we've shared many times, and I'll finish up with this, that we see right here when it says seven weeks, so there's a seven years of seals, three score and two weeks, it's about just under a little under three and a half years, which is the first half of trumpets. The wall and the streets and the temple will be built again, even in troublous times. And after those about three and a half years, Messiah himself will be cut off. This is when the war breaks out against the two witnesses. But not for himself, but the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. We know from Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, when Satan is cast down, he goes after them with a flood, and they flee away at midst trumpets for the final three and a half years. Time, comma, and times, comma, and a half. One plus two plus a half, that's three and a half years which means they're taken away for the final three and a half years of trumpets, which means they don't come back until the Jubilee trumpet when they will receive their land, even after the final year of the days of Noah. And look at what it says. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. How long is this war? How long is this period going to last? It's going to last two and a half of the final three and a half years. That's why we have one more week of years, one more year, when the Lord returns to bring destruction for all of the overspreading of abominations that the prince had made, that the little pea prince had made. How do we know that it's two and a half? We get it right here. When he says in Daniel 12, verse 7, how long shall this be? And he says that it'll be for time, times, no end. So there's no plus. And a half. So one two plus a half, two and a half of the final three and a half years when he will have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people 
All these things shall be finished. This is why in Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses and this war that we see against them, nobody seemed to understand how long it is. It lasts for two and a half years from the fifth, the beginning of the fifth trumpet to the end of the sixth trumpet is two and a half years when the two witnesses are then killed. Then they rise up, right? They stand up. There's your 10th part we shared earlier. 7,000 die. The remnant are frightened. Give glory to the God of heaven. The second, the, the second woe, which is the sixth trumpet, has now passed. And what happens? The Lord is returning feet down on the Mount of Olives now. Guys, they know that he must die as Messiah ben Joseph. But the Christians cannot accept or understand it. The prophecies of Judah will still be fulfilled, and they will be fulfilled after the prophecies of the church are complete. They are looking for a Messiah ben Joseph, high priest and king Melchizedek, destroy their enemies with another one who will be there, who is the Messiah through, through the Davidic line, but not Messiah ben David, but through the Davidic line as Zerubbabel, who will rebuild the city and the streets and the temple while the high priest king of Messiah ben Joseph is there and the 144,000 are with him. And we see these events that happen and that crumble through some of them for which he must be sacrificed for this priestly line because they were anointed with the word, uh, uh, with the father's name written on their foreheads that they cannot be left. So he must die for that priestly line. And it all goes back to Aaron. The first one was Moses and that was for the portion of the house of Israel, and for all the tribes, really. And it was for the priestly line in the end. Guys, it's beautiful. Let's listen to this last piece. Not depends how, you, how things turn out. And after him will appear the Messiah, son of David. The Messiah, son of David, will defeat first defeat the enemies of Israel. He will complete the unification of the ten tribes with Judah. He will let every Israeli... Every Israelite know what tribe they pertain, they pertain to. They will know what tribes they pertain, pertain to. They will settle in tribal areas. In the land of the greater land of Israel and also in the countries that they now live on, they will become part of the land of Israel. They will become part of the greater land of Israel. You see that? So where, do, where does it end? Kind of where we were beginning it all, right? So what does he say? Then Messiah ben David comes. When Messiah ben David comes, he will reunite them all. It'll be the final fulfillment of all of them coming together again. And when he comes, we know who he's coming as, Messiah ben David, when he returns feet down. This is, this is that video of the four messiahs. And when he comes, who's he coming as? As the line of the tribe of Judah, which is through the line of David, which is Revelation 19, when he will destroy all the enemies in the grapes of the wrath of Almighty God. And when that final year is over, he will bring all of the tribes back into their land and they will all receive their portion of land just as we've shared and broken down as the end of Ezekiel 47 into 48. And they all receive their portions of land directly lined up in our chapters to years with Ezekiel chapter 48 right there in the Jubilee year. Man, man. Brothers and sisters, I hope this blesses you. I hope it gives you a greater understanding and, and draws you in closer, shows you this connection from, from the Gentile perspective, from the Jewish perspective. What, what causes this headbutting? We know that there was this blindness given in part for them, for our sakes, for the church, for the world. And that when their portion was over, it would be the time of Judah's portion. And the Jews realize what their portion is. And this one is very well versed in understanding that this portion for the world, for the house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in with them, that they have something of, of, of in, in, in imprisonment and, and devastation and enemies that come against them before the Messiah ben Joseph shows up. And when Messiah ben Joseph shows up, he brings them both together. And when he brings them both together, he defeats the enemies, brings them into the land, as we know jo Joshua did. Joshua, Yeshua, brings them over in the Passover land. 
and a portion goes in there. The rebuilding and everything takes place. He's now there as high priest and king. He's there with the Zerubbabel line. And he's Jesus is there with the priestly line as the high priest. And we know that he must die again for these things that these guys are doing, which is the connection to the priestly line for which him as the bull must die again. For when he dies again and resurrects and goes up after that battle that takes place when he dies in the war that took place for two and a half years, he's then resurrected and then he returns as the final Messiah once and for all, feet down on the Mount of Olives as Messiah ben David of the tribe of the line of Judah, the lion of Judah, with his garments dipped in blood from the grapes of wrath of Almighty God in the final 14th year battle. And when it's all done, brings all the tribes back, brings all the tribes back from those who had been taken into the wilderness, protected for the final three and a half years, and gives them all their portion in their divisions of land. And the jubilee, which is precisely what happens in the final jubilee at the atoning of jubilee at the beginning of the 50th year, which will also be the beginning of the millennial reign, they will receive their portions of land and all debts forgiven. How is that? The reuniting, the, the unification of the church and Judah, of the house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, and Judah revealed together in their understanding for the end of days. It's a mind blower, guys. It is so absolutely fascinating and fantastic to understand. We are absolutely a portion, at least, of a people being prepared. And I hope we're all prepared. Let's keep watching. Let's keep digging. Let's keep strengthening, praying for each other, for our families, and help and support us where and when you can. And we will get this done. We will continue to do it right to the end. And I hope and pray many more will, will be blessed to do what Ivan is doing and will even reach out to their own churches and, and ask to do Bible prophecy teachings in relation to the end of days within their church to lead them. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. Man. God is good. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.